treaties may effectively implement the constitutional imperative to human rights and consider social justice in all phases of development but so san a statute, as Republic Act No. 9851, the Philippine on Crimes Against International Humanitarian Law, Genocide and Other Crimes Against Humanity, does. The President, as primary architect of our foreign policy and as head state, is allowed by the Constitution to make preliminary determinations on what, at any given moment, might urgently be required in order that our foreign policy may manifest our national interest. Absent a clear and convincing showing of a breach of the constitutional law, brought through an actual, live controversy and by a party that direct, material and substantial injury as a result of such breach, this court will stay its hand in declaring a diplomatic act as unconstitutional. On March 15, 2018, the Philippines announced its withdrawal from International Criminal Court. On March 16, 2018, it formally submitted its notice of withdrawal through a note verbal to the United Nations Secretary-General's Chef de Cabinet. The Secretary-General received this communication the following day, March 17, 2018. Through these actions, the Philippines completed the requisite acts of this was all consistent and in compliance with what the Rome Statute plainly requires. By this point, all that were needed to enable have been consummated. Further, the International Criminal Court acknowledged the Philippines' action soon after it had withdrawn. This foreclosed the existence of a state of affairs correctable by this court's finite jurisdiction. The petitions were, therefore, moot when they were filed. Point one: The International Criminal Court's subsequent consummate acceptance of the withdrawal all but confirmed the futility of this court's insisting on a reversal of completed actions in any case, despite the withdrawal. This court finds no lesser of human rights within our system of laws. Neither do we agree, petitioners implied statements that without the treaty, the judiciary will be able to fulfill its mandate to protect human rights. Moreover, the Senate never sought to enforce what would have been prerogative to require its concurrence for withdrawal. To date, no. 249, which seeks to express the Chamber's position on the need for concurrence, has yet to be tabled and voted on. Individual senators standing to question the constitutionality of the actions of their chamber. Yet, in this case, as shown by the resolution which petitioners co-authored, they acknowledged that an action by the Senate was necessary coming to this court. Thus, no actual conflict or constitutional impasse has yet arisen even as implied by their actions. This court cannot compel or annul actions where the relevant are moot. Neither can this court, without due deference to the of a co-equal constitutional branch, act before the Senate has acted. Nonetheless, the President's discretion on unilaterally withdrawing any treaty or international agreement is not absolute. As primary architect of foreign policy, the President enjoys a degree leeway to withdraw from treaties. However, this leeway cannot go the President's authority under the Constitution and the laws. In cases, legislative involvement is imperative. The President unilaterally withdraw from a treaty if there is subsequent legislation affirms and implements it. Conversely, a treaty cannot amend a statute. When the President enters into a treaty that is inconsistent with a prior statute, the President may withdraw from it, unless the prior statute is amended to be consistent with the treaty. A statute enjoys primacy over a treaty. It is by both the House of Representatives and the Senate, and is signed into law by the President. In contrast, a treaty is negotiated by the President, and legislative participation is limited to Senate concurrence. Thus, there is greater participation by the Sovereign's elected representatives in the enactment of statutes. The extent of legislative involvement in withdrawing from treaties is determined by circumstances attendant to how the treaty was entered or came into effect. Where legislative imprimatur impelled the action to enter into a treaty, a withdrawal cannot be effected concomitant legislative sanction. Similarly, where the Senate's concurrence imposes as a condition the same concurrence for withdrawal, Zero enjoys no unilateral authority to withdraw, and must then slash secure Senate concurrence. Thus, the President can withdraw from a treaty as a matter of policy in keeping with our legal system, 
if a treaty is unconstitutional or contrary to of an existing prior statute. However, the President may not withdraw from a treaty, a, when the Senate conditionally concurs, such that it requires concurrence also to withdraw, or, b, when the itself will be contrary to a statute, or to a legislative authority to and enter into a treaty. Or an existing law which implements a this court resolves consolidated petitions for certiorari and mandamus under Rule 65 of the 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure, seeking to, a, declare the Philippines' withdrawal from the Rome Statute as invalid or ineffective. Since it was done without the concurrence of at least two-thirds of all the Senate's members, and, b, compel the executive branch to notify United Nations Secretary-General that it is cancelling, revoking and withdrawing the instrument of withdrawal. Petitioners maintain that the instrument of withdrawal is inconsistent with the Constitution. The Rome Statute is a multilateral treaty that established the International Criminal Court, where the gravest crimes under international law are prosecuted. For since 1996, under Fidel V. Ramos's, President Ramos, Presidency, the has participated in the court's establishment, taking an active in the deliberations as a member of the drafting committee. 5 On December 28, 2000, the Philippines, through then-President Ejercito Estrada, President Estrada, signed the Rome Statute of the Criminal Court. 6 President Estrada's act of signing the Rome Statute signified the intent to be bound by the provisions of the treaty subject to the domestic requirements for its validity and enforceability. 7 Particularly, Article 7, Section 21 of the 1987 Constitution 8 requires the concurrence by at least two-thirds of all members of the Senate for a treaty to be valid, effective, and enforceable. In the meantime, on July 1, 2002, the International Criminal Court's Rome Decision Statute entered into force. On December 11, 2009, with Senate concurrence to the Rome Statute pending, then-President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, President signed into Law Republic Act No. 9851, otherwise known as the Philippine Act on Crimes Against International Humanitarian Genocide, and Other Crimes Against Humanity. Republic Act No. 9851 replicated many of the Rome Statute's provisions. I.O. Senate concurrence to the Rome Statute was obtained following Benino Aquino Ills, President Aquino, election. On August 23, 2011, the Senate, with a vote of 17 to 1, passed Resolution No. 546 enabling Philippines consummate accession to the Rome Statute underscore 2 on August 30, 2011 the Philippines deposited the instrument of of the Rome Statute. On November 1, 2011, the Rome Statute entered into force in the Philippines. The country was the 16th state party to belong to the group of Asia-Pacific state parties in the International Criminal Court. 12 On June 30, 2016, President Aquino's term ended and President R.O.A. Duterte, President Duterte, took his oath as chief executive. On April 24, 2017, Attorney Jude Sabio filed a complaint before the criminal court pertaining to alleged summary killings when Duterte was the mayor of Davao City. 13 on June 6, 2017, Senator Antonio Trillanes IV and Representative Alajano filed a supplemental communication before the international court with regard to President Duterte's drug war. 14 on February 8. 2018. The Office of International Criminal Court Trial Fatu Bensida, Prosecutor Bensida, commenced the examination of the atrocities allegedly committed in the pursuant to the Duterte administration's war on drugs 15 on March 15, 2018. The Philippines announced that it was F from the International Criminal Court. President Duterte claimed that the country never became a state party to the Rome Statute since the treaty was not published in the official Gazette. 16 On March 16, 2018, the Philippines formally submitted its notice of from the International Criminal Court to the United Nations. Manalo, the permanent representative of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations in New York, deposited the note verbal Maria Luza Ribeiro Viotti.
Chef de Cabinet of the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres.17 The full text of this notification reads, The permanent mission of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations presents its compliments to the Secretary General of the United Nations and has the honor to inform the Secretary General of the decision of the Government of the Republic of the Philippines to withdraw from the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in accordance with the relevant provisions of the statute. The Philippines assures the community of nations that the Philippine government continues to be guided by the rule of law embodied in its constitution, which also enshrines the country's long-standing tradition of upholding human rights. The government affirms its commitment to fight against impunity for atrocity crimes, notwithstanding its withdrawal from the Rome Statute, especially since the Philippines has a national legislation punishing atrocity crimes. The government remains resolute in affecting its principal responsibility to ensure the long-term safety of the nation in order to promote inclusive national development and secure a decent and dignified life for all. The decision to withdraw is the Philippines' principled stand against those who politicize and weaponize human rights, even as its independent and well-functioning organs and agencies continue to exercise jurisdiction over complaints, issues. Problems and concerns arising from its efforts to protect its people. The permanent mission of the Republic of the Philippines to the United Nations avails itself of this opportunity to renew to the Secretary General of the United Nations the assurances of its highest consideration. 18 on March 17, 2018. The Secretary General of the United Nations The notification from the Philippine Government. 19 slash on May 16, 2018. Senators Francis Pangilinan, Senator Pangilinan, Drylan, Paolo Benino Aquino, Lila de Lima, Risa Hontaviros, and Antonio Trillanes four filed a petition for certiorari and mandamus. 20 The Executive's Unilateral Act of Withdrawing from the Rome Statute for Being Unconstitutional. This petition was docketed as GR No. Later, Senator Pangilinan would manifest in the oral arguments relating to Senate Resolution No. 289, a resolution expressing sense of the Senate that termination of, or withdrawal from, treaties and international agreements concurred in by the Senate shall be valid and only upon concurrence by the Senate. The resolution was noted to have not been calendared for agenda in the Senate. Point 21 Meanwhile, on June 13, 2018, the Philippine Coalition for the of the International Criminal Court, and its members, Loretta and P. Rosales, Dr. Aurora Corazon A. Perong, Evelyn Balasarano, among others, also filed a petition for certiorari and mandamus, docket as GR No. 239,483. 22 On July 6, 2018, the Office of the Solicitor General filed its comment to the petitions. 23 On August 14, 2018, the Integrated Bar of the Philippines filed its Petition 24 and an omnibus ex part motion for consolidation and for in the oral arguments. 25 This petition was docketed as GR No. 240,954. Oral arguments were conducted on August 28, 2018, September 4, and October 9, 2018. At the termination of oral arguments, this court the parties to file their respective memoranda within 30 days. 26 In his March 18, 2019 press release, the Assembly of State Parties Mr. Ogon Kwan reiterated his regret regarding the withdrawal of the Philippines, effective as of March 17, 2019. From the Rome Statute 27 He expressed hope that the country rejoins the treaty in the future. 28 the three consolidated petitions before this court seek similar reliefs. In GR No. 238,875, petitioners senators argue that, as a treaty that the validly entered into, the Rome Statute has the same status as an of Congress. 29 As a law in the Philippines 30 They claim that President cannot repeal a law 31 They aver that the country's withdrawal from a treaty requires the concurrence of at least two-thirds of Senate. 32 in GR No. 239,483, 
Petitioner Philippine Coalition for the Criminal Court and its members assert that their rights to life, security and dignity were impaired by the withdrawal from the Rome Statute.33 citing a decision of the South African High Court. They also claim that the ratification of and withdrawal from a multilateral treaty the Senate's concurrence. 34 According to them, contrary to the assertion, the Rome Statute is effective in Philippine jurisdiction virtue of the Constitution's incorporation clause. Despite lack of 35 petitioners pray that the notification of withdrawal be declared or ineffective 36 or void of initio 37 and that the executive, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Philippine Permanent Mission to the United Nations, be required to notify the Secretary General of the United the notice is cancelled, revoked or withdrawn. 38 respondents, through the Office of the Solicitor General, counter that petitioners in GR no. 238,875 do not have locus standi as they do not represent the official stand of the Senate as a body 39 neither do the petitioners in GR no. 239,483 have standing to question the wisdom of the sovereign power to withdraw from the Rome Statute. Absent any of actual or immediate danger of sustaining a direct injury as a result of said withdrawal 40 respondents claim that a Rule 65 petition is improper because the acts of the President complained of were not in the exercise of judicial or quasi-powers.41 Moreover, mandamus cannot lie against a discretionary act of a President, much less an act which is not enjoined as a duty, such as ratification of a treaty. 42 They posit that the petitions do not present a justiciable controversy The withdrawal from a treaty is a political question, being a policy determination delegated to the wisdom of the executive. 43 Specifically, President is the sole organ of the nation in its external relations, and its sole representative with foreign nations 44 Respondents assert that the Constitution does not expressly require Senate concurrence in withdrawing from a treaty. 45 respondents maintain that the withdrawal was valid for having complied with the Rome Statute, which requires only a written notification withdrawal. 46 respondents also allege that the decision to withdraw from the Rome Statute was an act to protect national sovereignty from interference and to the judiciary's independence, 47 which was necessary given Bensida's preliminary examination. This allegedly violates the complementarity principle under the Rome Statute. 48 Lastly, respondents aver that the rights being protected under the statute are adequately safeguarded by domestic laws. 49 The only effect, they say, is that the Philippines will no longer be under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. 50 Respondents pray that the consolidated petitions be denied for lack of 51 for this court's resolution are the following issues. First, whether or not petitioners have sufficiently discharged their of showing that this case is justiciable. Subsumed under this issue the following, 1. Whether or not the consolidated petitions present an actual, justiciable controversy, 2. Whether or not each of the, consolidated petitions were timely filed, 3. Whether or not petitioners have the requisite standing to file their respective petitions, 4. Whether or not the consolidated petitions were filed in violation of the principle of hierarchy of courts, 5. Whether or not the issues raised by the consolidated petitions pertain to political questions, and 6. Whether or not petitioners resort to the procedural vehicles of petitions for certiorari and mandamus is proper. Second, whether or not the Philippines' withdrawal from the Rome through a note verbal delivered to the Secretary General of the Nations is valid, binding, and effectual. This involves the following issues, 1. Whether or not the Philippines complied with all the requisites for withdrawal from the Rome Statute, 2. Whether or not the executive can unilaterally withdraw from a treaty. This encompasses, a. Whether or not the executive had valid grounds to withdraw from the Rome Statute, b. Whether or not withdrawing from a treaty requires legislative action, c. Whether or not the executive's withdrawal from the Rome Statute violated any legislative act or prerogative, and d. Whether or not withdrawing from a treaty demands the concurrence of at least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate. Third, whether or not the Philippines' withdrawal from the Rome places the Philippines in breach of its obligations under international lastly, 
whether or not the Philippines' withdrawal from the Rome Statute will diminish the Filipino people's protection under international law, even if it does. Whether or not this is a justiciable question. I. Through Article 7, Section 21 of the Constitution, the Rome Statute, International Instrument, was transformed and made part of the law of the land. Entry into the Rome Statute represented the Philippines' commitment the international community to prosecute individuals accused of international crimes. Its validity and effectivity hinged on the passage of Senate Resolution No. 546, which embodied the Senate's concurrence to the accession to the Rome Statute. Petitioners believe that President Duterte's unilateral withdrawal from Rome Statute transgressed legislative prerogatives. Ultimately, this court may only rule in an appropriate, justiciable controversy raised by a party who suffers from direct, substantial, and injury. Once again, we clarify our role within the constitutional order. We take this occasion to emphasize the need for this court to exercise restraint in cases that fail to properly present justiciable controversies, brought by parties who fail to demonstrate their standing. This is especially when our pronouncements will cause confusion in the diplomatic sphere and undermine our international standing and repute. Petitioners are before us through the vehicles of petitions for certiorari and mandamus under Rule 65 of the Rules of Court, praying that the notice of withdrawal be declared void of initio, and that the withdrawal itself be declared invalid. They also pray for a writ of mandamus to direct the Executive Secretary to recall and revoke the notice of withdrawal, and to submit the issue before the Senate for its deliberation. 52 These petitions fail on significant procedural grounds. It is true that this court, in the exercise of its judicial power, can craft to interpret Article 7, Section 21 of the Constitution and determine the extent to which Senate concurrence in treaty withdrawal is however. It will be excessive for any such framework to be imposed on the circumstances surrounding these present petitions seeing as the incidents here are fait accompli. Petitioners insist that the protection of human rights will be weakened, yet their contentions are mere surmises. Ample protection for human rights the domestic sphere remain formally in place. It is a canon of that the court should not form a rule of constitutional law than is required by the precise facts to which it is applied. 53 Contrary to petitioners' claim these cases do not deal with the results the ongoing preliminary examination by Prosecutor Bensuda. Article 127 of the Rome Statute covers that point 54 Neither at issue here is whether a president may decide to re-enter the Rome Statute and secure the Senate concurrence. It is possible that whatever the results in these cases are, a future administration under a new president can make that decision. Petitioners want a different political result from what the president has and so they implore this court to veto his action, raising serious policy in so doing. This court must exercise restraint in the face of posturing, and must anchor its determinations not on political results, but on principles and the text found in the constitution and law. The most basic of these principles are parameters that determine the justiciability of cases. Judicial office impels capacity to rule in keeping with what the Constitution or law mandates, even when potentially contrary to what a may prefer politically. 2. To understand the implications of these cases, a brief overview of the statute is necessary. On July 17, 1998, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal was adopted in a conference participated in by 120 states. 55 It created 11 International Criminal Court a permanent autonomous institution 56 that was given jurisdiction to investigate, prosecute and try individuals accused of international crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and the crime of aggression. 57 On the heels of World War I, during the 1919 Paris Peace Conference, tribunal that will prosecute leaders accused of international crimes was first proposed in modem times. I.R. 1937, the League of Nations a conference in Geneva, where 13 states signed the first convention aiming to establish a permanent international court. However, none of the states ratified it and its aims failed to materialize. 58 Following World War II and the Axis powers aggressive military 59 in Europe and Asia, 
60 The Allied powers established ad hoc to try Axis leaders accused of international crimes. 61 Consequently, a draft of the Charter of an International Tribunal was in a meeting in London among representatives from France, the Kingdom, the United States, and the Union of Soviet Socialist on August 8, 1945, the London Agreement was signed. It established the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal. 62 The tribunal sat in Nuremberg, Germany, and tried the most notorious Nazi war criminals. 63 Its jurisdiction was limited to crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. 64 19 Other states subsequently supported the London Agreement. 65 In January 1946, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers, Douglas MacArthur, established the International Military Tribunal the Far East, more commonly known as the Tokyo International Military 66. The Tokyo trial was conducted from May 3, 1946 to November 12, 1948. 67. Upon termination of their respective trials, the Nuremberg and Tokyo military tribunals also ceased to operate. 68. The United Nations General Assembly later put to task the Law Commission, a committee of legal experts who worked for the development and codification of international law. The Commission asked to look into the possibility of establishing a permanent international criminal court. Drafts were subsequently produced, but the Cold War impeded its progress. 69. As work continued on the draft, the United Nations Security Council more ad hoc tribunals in the early 1990s to address large-scale atrocities involving the Yugoslavian Wars of Dissolution and the Genocide of 1994,70 The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda were established. These temporary tribunals underscored the need for a international court. In 1994, the International Law Commission submitted a proposal to United Nations General Assembly, creating a permanent international criminal court. Point 71 The year after, a preparatory committee was convened. Point 72 In April 1998, the amended draft treaty was presented to the United General Assembly. And the Rome Conference commenced in June 1998. Point 73 On July 17, 1998, 120 states voted m favor of the draft treaty, in its adoption. Point 74 On July 1, 2002, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court into force upon ratification by 60 states. 75 This formally constituted International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has an international legal 76 and sits at The Hague in the Netherlands. 77 It may exercise its functions and powers on the territory of any estate PRD and, by special agreement, on the territory of any other estate 78 state parties to the Rome Statute recognize the jurisdiction of the criminal court over the following, Articles Crimes within the jurisdiction of the court 1. The jurisdiction of the court shall be limited to the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. The court has jurisdiction in accordance with this statute with respect to the following crimes, a. The crime of genocide, b crimes against humanity, c, war crimes, d, the crime of aggression. The International Criminal Court's jurisdiction is complementary to criminal jurisdictions. 79 Complementarity means that the criminal court may only exercise jurisdiction if domestic courts were unwilling or unable to prosecute. 80 Article 17 of the Rome Statute contemplates these situations, too. In order to determine unwillingness in a particular case, the court shall consider, having regard to the principles of due process recognized by international law, whether one or more of the following exist. As applicable, a. The proceedings were or are being undertaken or the national decision was made for the purpose of shielding the person concerned from criminal responsibility for crimes within the jurisdiction of the court referred to in Article 5, b. There has been an unjustified delay in the proceedings which in the circumstances is inconsistent with an intent to bring the person concerned to justice, c. The proceedings were not or are not being conducted independently or impartially, and they were or are being conducted in a manner which, in the circumstances, is inconsistent with an intent to bring the person concerned to justice. 3. In order to determine inability in a particular case, 
the court shall consider whether, due to a total or substantial collapse or unavailability of its national judicial system, the state is unable to obtain the accused or the necessary evidence and testimony or otherwise unable to carry out its proceedings. Emphasis supplied, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over natural persons. Liability shall attach to one who, a, commits such a crime, whether as an individual, jointly with another or through another person, regardless of whether that other person is criminally responsible, b, orders, solicits or induces the commission of such a crime which in fact occurs or is attempted, c, for the purpose of facilitating the commission of such a crime, aids, abets or otherwise assists in its commission or its attempted commission, including providing the means for its commission, d, in any other way contributes to the commission or attempted commission of such a crime by a group of persons acting with a common purpose. Such contribution shall be intentional and shall either, 1. Be made with the aim of furthering the criminal activity or criminal purpose of the group, where such activity or purpose involves the commission of a crime within the jurisdiction of the court, or 11. Be made in the knowledge of the intention of the group to commit the crime, e, in respect of the crime of genocide, directly and publicly incites others to commit genocide, f attempts to commit such a crime by taking action that commences its execution by means of a substantial step. But the crime does not occur because of circumstances independent of the person's intentions. However, a person who abandons the effort to commit the crime or otherwise prevents the completion of the crime shall not be liable for punishment under this statute for the attempt to commit that crime if that person completely and voluntarily gave up the criminal purpose. Point 81 Individual Criminal Responsibility under the Rome Statute does not state responsibility in international law. 82 Further, the Rome Statute additional grounds of criminal responsibility for commanders and other superiors. 83 In determining liability under the Rome Statute, a person's official capacity is irrelevant. 1. This statute shall apply equally to all persons without any distinction based on official capacity. In particular, official capacity as a head of state or government, a member of a government or parliament, an elected representative or a government official shall in no case exempt a person from criminal responsibility under this statute, nor shall it, in and of itself, constitute a ground for reduction of sentence. 2. Immunities or special procedural rules which may attach to the official capacity of a person, whether under national or international law, shall not bar the court from exercising its jurisdiction over such a person. 84 The Rome Statute provides that state parties are obliged to give their cooperation toward the International Criminal Court's investigation and prosecution of crimes within its jurisdiction. 85 The International Criminal Court may request, through the diplomatic channel or any other appropriate as may be designated by each state party upon ratification, approval, or accession, state parties to cooperate. 86 It may measures to ensure the safety or physical or psychological well of any victims, potential witnesses and their families. 87 The International Criminal Court may also ask for cooperation and assistance from any intergovernmental organization pursuant to and with the organization and in accordance with its competence and 88 state payees are required to ensure that their national law a procedure for all of the forms of cooperation specified in Part 9 of the Treaty. 89A State Party's failure to comply with the International Criminal Court's request to cooperate would warrant the International Criminal Court's finding to that effect. It will then refer the matter to the Assembly State's Parties or, WHERE the Security Council referred the matter to the Criminal Court, to the Security Council 90 The Assembly of State's Parties is the International Criminal Court's oversight and legislative body comprised of representatives of all the states that ratified and acceded to the Rome Statute. 91 Upon a finding of conviction, the International Criminal Court may any of the following penalties. a. Imprisonment for a specified number of years, which may not exceed a maximum of 30 years, or b. A term of life imprisonment when justified by the extreme gravity of the crime and the individual circumstances of the convicted person. 2. In addition to imprisonment, the court may order, a, a fine under the criteria provided for in the rules of procedure and evidence, b, 
a forfeiture of proceeds, property and assets derived directly or indirectly from that crime, without prejudice to the rights of bona fide third parties. 92 All disputes involving the International Criminal Court's judicial are settled by its decision. 93 Disputes of at least two state parties which relate to the application of the Rome Statute, and which are unsettled negotiations within three months of their commencement, shall be to the Assembly of States Parties. The Assembly may settle the dispute or may make recommendations on further means of settlement of the dispute. 94 Article 127 of the Rome Statute provides mechanisms on how a state may withdraw from it. 1. A state party may, by written notification addressed to the Secretary General of the United Nations, withdraw from this statute. The withdrawal shall take effect one year after the date of receipt of the notification, unless the notification specifies a later date. 2. A state shall not be discharged, by reason of its withdrawal, from the obligations arising from this statute while it was a party to the statute, including any financial obligations which may have accrued. Its withdrawal shall not affect any cooperation with the court in connection with criminal investigations and proceedings in relation to which the withdrawing state had a duty to cooperate and which were commenced prior to the date on which the withdrawal became effective. Nor shall it prejudice in any way the continued consideration of any matter which was already under consideration by the court prior to the date on which the withdrawal became effective. Burundi is, thus far, the only other state party to withdraw from the statute. In accordance with Article 127, 1, of the Rome Statute, it sent a written notification of withdrawal to the Secretary-General of the Criminal Court on October 27, 2016. Burundi's withdrawal effected on October 26, 2017. 95 Following Burundi, South Africa, Gambia and the Philippines their intent to withdraw. Nonetheless, Gambia and South Africa their notifications of withdrawal on February 10, 2017 and March 7, 2017, respectively. 96-3 On March 24, 1998, President Ramos issued Administrative Order 387, which created a task force on the proposed establishment of the International Criminal Court. The task force was composed of the following. Department of Foreign Affairs Chairman Department of Justice Co-Chairman Office of the Solicitor General Member Office of the Executive Secretary Slash, Office of the Chief Presidential Legal Counsel Member Department of Interior and Local Government Member University of the Philippines College of Law Member 97 The task force had the following duties, 1. Undertake studies and researches pertaining to the proposed establishment of the International Criminal Court, 2. Formulate policy recommendations to serve as inputs in the review and consolidation of the Philippine government's position in the preparatory committee meetings of the ICC and the United Nations General Assembly. 3. Identify and recommend legislative measures necessary in the furtherance of the foregoing. 4. Serve as a forum for the resolution of issues and concerns pertaining to the establishment of the ICC. 5. Pursue other related functions which may be deemed necessary by the President. 98 From June 15, 1998 to July 17, 1998, the Philippines participated in United Nations Diplomatic Conference of Plenipotentiaries on the of an International Criminal Court in Rome. Then Foreign Affairs Under Secretary Loro L. Baja the Philippine head of Delegation 99 delivered a speech that explained the country's position, commitment and participation on the establishment of the International Criminal Court. His points are summarized, as follows, 7. Mr. Baja, Philippines said that his country aspired to the establishment of an international criminal court that would dispense justice efficiently and effectively an institution that was ineffective in addressing the problem of impunity of the perpetrators of the most heinous violations of the laws of humanity would not serve justice or help to maintain international peace and security. The position of the Philippines, consistent with its constitutional and legal traditions, was based on those considerations and on its desire to uphold the current evolution of international law. 8. National judicial systems should have primacy in trying crimes and punishing the guilty. 
the International Criminal Court should complement those systems and seek action only when national institutions did not exist, could not function or were otherwise unavailable. The court should have jurisdiction over the core crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and aggression, but its statute should contain an additional provision allowing for the future inclusion of other crimes that affect the very fabric of the international system. 9. The prosecutor should be independent and be entitled to investigate complaints proprio motu, subject to the safeguards provided by a supervisory pretrial chamber. The use of weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, must be considered a war crime. The definition of war crimes and crimes against humanity should include special consideration of the interests of minors and of gender sensitivity. The statute should provide for an age below which there was exemption from criminal responsibility, and persons under 18 years of age should not be recruited into the armed forces. The sexual abuse of women committed as an act of war or in a way that constituted a crime against humanity should be deemed particularly reprehensible. The crime of rape should be gender neutral and classified as a crime against persons. A schedule of penalties should be prescribed for each core crime defined in the statute, following the principle that there was no crime if there was no penalty. Which would also meet the due process requirement that the accused should be fully apprised of the charges against them and of the penalties attaching to the alleged crimes. 10. The Philippines supported the positions set out by the state's members of the Movement of Non-Aligned Countries at the Ministerial Meeting of the Coordinating Bureau of the Movement of Non-Aligned Countries, held in Cartagena de Indias, Colombia, in May 1998, and was prepared to make the necessary changes to its national laws required by the establishment of the Court. Point 100, emphasis supplied, in the same conference, the Philippines, through its alternate head of Han. Franklin M. Ebdelin, 101 voted to adopt the Rome Statute, and explained its vote, Tihi Statute contained the vital elements of an international criminal court, with jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Gender-based and sex-related crimes and acts committed in non-international armed conflicts. The prosecutor could initiate proceedings proprio motu, independently of the Security Council. 22. The restrictions on admissibility had been reduced to an acceptable MM1 mum. The principle of complementarity was assured, giving due regard to the national jurisdiction and sovereignty of states' parties. Finally, there were provisions for restitution, compensation, and rehabilitation for victims. 23. On the other hand, some provisions detracted from those strengths. Some new definitions dot of war crimes constituted a retrograde step in the development of international law. The applicability of the aggression provisions had been postponed pending specific definition of the crime, and states' parties had the option off reservations on the applicability of war crimes provisions. Finally, the Security Council could seek deferral of prosecution for a one-year period, renewable for an apparently unlimited number of times. 24. Nevertheless, he was confident that the International Criminal Court could succeed with the support of the international community and had therefore decided to vote in dot favor of the statute. 102, emphasis supplied, on December 28, 2000, the Philippines 103 signed the Rome Statute. It was still subject to ratification, acceptance, or approval by signatory estates 104. It was also necessary that instruments of ratification be deposited with the Secretary General of the United Nations. 105 Later, Senator Aquilino Pimentel, Jr., Representative Loretta and the Philippine Coalition for the Establishment of the International Criminal Court, the Task Force Detainees of the Philippines, and the of Victims of Involuntary Disappearances, among others. Filed AF for mandamus before this court to compel the Office of the Secretary and the Department of Foreign Affairs to transmit the signed copy of the Rome Statute to the Senate for its concurrence. 106 Their petition was dismissed. In Pimentel, Jr. v. Executive Secretary, 107 This court noted that it was beyond its jurisdiction to compel executive branch of the government to transmit the signed text of the statute to the Senate 108 Pimentel Jr. Quoted Justice Isagani A. Cruz, 
who had earlier explained the following concerning the treaty making the usual steps in the treaty making process are, negotiation, signature, ratification and exchange of the instruments of ratification. The treaty may then be submitted for registration and publication under the UN Charter, although this step is not essential to the validity of the agreement as between the parties. Negotiation may be undertaken directly by the head of state but he now usually assigns this task to his authorized representatives. These representatives are provided with credentials known as full powers, which they exhibit to the other negotiators at the start of the formal discussions. It is standard practice for one of the parties to submit a draft of the proposed treaty which, together with the counter-proposals, becomes the basis of the subsequent negotiations. The negotiations may be brief or protracted, depending on the issues involved, and may even collapse in case the parties are unable to come to an agreement on the points under consideration. If and when the negotiators finally decide on the terms of the treaty, the same is opened for signature. This step is primarily intended as a means of authenticating the instrument and for the purpose of symbolizing the good faith of the parties, but, significantly, it does not indicate the final consent of the state in cases where ratification of the treaty is required. The document is ordinarily signed in accordance with the alternate, that is, each of the several negotiators is allowed to sign first on the copy which he will bring home to his own state. Ratification, which is the next step is the formal act by which a state confirms and accepts the provisions of a treaty concluded by its representatives. The purpose of ratification is to enable the contracting states to examine the treaty more closely and to give them an opportunity to refuse to be bound by it should they find it inimical to their interests. It is for this reason that most treaties are made subject to the scrutiny and consent of a department of the government other than that which negotiated them. The last step in the treaty-making process is the exchange of the instruments of ratification, which usually also signifies the effectivity of the treaty unless a different date has been agreed upon by the parties. Where ratification is dispensed with and no effectivity clause is embodied in the treaty, the instrument is deemed effective upon its signature. Point 109, emphasis in the original, this court declared that submission to ratification is generally held be an executive act. 110 and it binds the state to the signed statute. It concluded that upon signature through a representative, the president exercises discretion on whether to ratify the statute or not, after the treaty is signed by the state's representative, the president, being accountable to the people, is burdened with the responsibility and the duty to carefully study the contents of the treaty and ensure that they are not inimical to the interest of the state and its people. Thus, the President has the discretion even after the signing of the treaty by the Philippine representative whether or not to ratify the same. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties does not contemplate to defeat or even restrain this power of the head of states. If that were so, the requirement of ratification of treaties would be pointless and futile. It has been held that a state has no legal or even moral duty to ratify a treaty which has been signed by its plenipotentiaries. There is no legal obligation to ratify a treaty, but it goes without saying that the refusal must be based on substantial grounds and not on superficial or whimsical reasons. Otherwise, the other state would be justified in taking offense. It should be emphasized that under our Constitution, the power to ratify is vested in the President, subject to the concurrence of the Senate. The role of the Senate, however, is limited only to giving or withholding its consent, or concurrence, to the ratification. Hence, it is within the authority of the President to refuse to submit a treaty to the Senate or, having secured its consent for its ratification, refuse to ratify it. Although the refusal of a state to ratify a treaty which has been signed in its behalf is a serious step that should not be taken lightly, such decision is within the competence of the President alone, which cannot be encroached by this court via a writ of mandamus. This court has no jurisdiction over actions seeking to enjoin the president in the performance of his official duties. Point 111, citations omitted, in 2009, President Macapagal Arroyo signed into Law Republic Act 9851, which replicated many of the then unratified Rome statutes some PROV 1S 10 NS, however, are significantly different. In some aspects, the law went beyond the Rome statute. It broadened the definition slash of torture, 
added the conscription of child soldiers as a war crime, 112 and stipulated jurisdiction over crimes against humanity anywhere in the world. Long as the offender or victim is Filipino.113 This removes complementarity as a R underscore requirement for prosecution of crimes against under the ratified treaty. While the treaty's language had to be refined to take the interests of other countries into consideration, 114 the law was independently passed considering all our interests. This independent, initiative strengthened our own criminal justice system. On February 28, 2011, President Aquino sent the signed Rome Statute the Senate for concurrence. 115 on August 23, 2011, the Senate passed no. 546, which embodied the country's accession to the Rome Statute. 116 on August 30, 2011, the Philippines deposited its instrument of to the United Nations Secretary General. Thus, the Rome Statute took effect in the Philippines on November 1, 2011. 117 4. The Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Vienna Convention, defines treaties as international agreement as concluded between states in written form and governed by international law. Whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments and whatever its designation. 118 In our jurisdiction, we characterize treaties as international agreements entered into by the Philippines which require legislative concurrence after executive ratification. This term may include compacts like conventions, declarations, covenants, and Acts 119 treaties under the Vienna Convention include all written international regardless of their nomenclature. In international law, no difference exists in the agreement's binding effect on states, notwithstanding nations opt to designate the document. However, Philippine law distinguishes treaties from executive v treaties and executive agreements are equally binding on the however. An executive agreement, a, does not require concurrence, b, is usually less formal, and, c, deals with a range of subject matters. 120 executive agreements dispense with Senate concurrence because of the legal mandate with which they are concluded. 121 they simply implement existing policies and are thus entered into, 1, to a colon colon, t the details of a treaty, 2, pursuant to or upon confirmation by an act of the legislature, or, 3, in the exercise of the President's independent powers under the Constitution. The raison d'etre of executive agreements hinges on prior constitutional or legislative authorizations. 122, emphasis supplied, citations omitted, however. This court had previously stated that this difference in form in international law, the special nature of an executive agreement is not just a domestic variation in international agreements. International practice has accepted the use of various forms and designations of international agreements, ranging from the tradite finale notion of a treaty which connotes a formal, solemn instrument to engagements concluded in modern, simplified forms that no longer necessitate ratification. An international agreement may take different forms, treaty, act, protocol, agreement, concordat, compromis d'arbitrage, convention, covenant, declaration, exchange of notes, statute, pact, charter, agreed minute, memorandum of agreement, modus vivendi, or some other form. Consequently, under international law, the distinction between a treaty and an international agreement or even an executive agreement is irrelevant for purposes of determining international rights and obligations. 123, citations omitted. Emphasis in the original, this court also cautioned that this local affectation does not mean that the constitutionally required Senate concurrence may be conveniently disregarded, however, this principle does no mean that the domestic law distinguishing treaties, international agreements, and executive agreements is relegated to a mere variation in form, or that the constitutional requirement of Senate concurrence is demoted to an optional constitutional directive. There remain two very important features that distinguish treaties from executive agreements and translate them into terms of art in the domestic setting. First, executive agreements must remain traceable to an express or implied authorization under the constitution, statutes, or treaties. 
The absence of these precedents puts the validity and effectivity of executive agreements under serious question for the main function of the executive is to enforce the constitution and the laws enacted by the legislature, not to defeat or interfere in the performance of these rules. In turn, executive agreements cannot create new international obligations that are not expressly allowed or reasonably implied in the law they purport to implement. Second, treaties are, by their very nature, considered superior to executive agreements. Treaties are products of the acts of the executive and the Senate unlike executive agreements, which are solely executive actions. Because of legislative participation through the Senate, a treaty is regarded as being on the same level as a statute. If there is an irreconcilable conflict, a later law or treaty takes precedence over one that is prior. An executive agreement is treated differently. Executive agreements that are inconsistent with either a law or a treaty are considered ineffective. Both types of international agreement are nevertheless subject to the supremacy of the Constitution. This rule does not imply, though, that the President is given carte blanche to exercise this discretion. Although the Chief Executive wields the exclusive authority to conduct our foreign relations, this power must still be exercised within the context and the parameters set by the Constitution as well as by existing domestic and international laws J124, emphasis supplied. Citations omitted, international agreements 125 fall under these two general categories, are, are outlined in Executive Order No. 459, which provides guidelines on TJ. These agreements enter into force in the domestic sphere. 126 6. Though both are sources of international law, Treaties must be from generally accepted principles of international law. Article 3.8 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice The Sources of International Law, 127a International conventions, whether general or particular, establishing rules expressly recognized by the contesting states, b. International custom, as evidence of a general practice accepted as law, c. The general principles of law recognized by civilized nations, d. Subject to the provisions of Article 59, judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations, as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law. 2. Constitute 0 NAL, provisions incorporate or transform portions of law into the domestic sphere, namely, 1, Article 2, Section 2, embodies the incorporation method, and, 2, Article 7, Section 21, covers the transformation method. They state, Article 2 Declaration of Principles and State Policies Principles Section 2. The Philippines renounces war as an instrument of national policy, adopts TLTE generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land and adheres to the policy of peace, equality, justice, freedom, cooperation, and amity with all nations. Article 7 Executive Department Section 21 No treaty or international agreement shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by at least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate. Emphasis supplied, the sources of international law International conventions, international custom, general principles of law, and judicial decisions are treated differently in our jurisdiction. Article 2 Section 2 of the Constitution declares that international custom and general principles of law are adopted as part of the law of the land. No further act is necessary to facilitate this, generally accepted principles of international law refers to norms of general or customary international law which are binding on all states, i.e., renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy, the principle of sovereign immunity. A person's right to life, liberty, and due process, and Pacta Sunt Servanda, among others. The concept of generally accepted principles of law has also been depicted in this wise, some legal scholars and judges look upon certain general principles of law as a primary source of international law because they have the character of Jews' rationale and are valid through all kinds of human societies. O'Connell holds that certain principles are part of international law because they are basic to legal systems generally and hence part of the Jews' gentium. These principles, he believes, are established by a process of reasoning based on the common identity of all legal systems. If there should be doubt or disagreement, 
one must look to state practice and determine whether the municipal law principle provides a just and acceptable solution. Point 128, citations omitted, emphasis supplied, in his separate opinion in Government of the United States of America v. Pergonin, 129 Justice Jose C. Vidug, Justice Vidug, underscored that as a slash source of international law, general principles of law are only secondary to international conventions and international customs. He stressed that while international conventions and customs are based on the consent of nations, 130 general principles of law have yet to have a binding definition, Article 38, 1, c, is identified as being a secondary source of international law and, therefore, not ranked at par with treaties and customary international law. The phrase is innately vague, and its exact meaning still eludes any general consensus. The widely preferred opinion, however, appears to be that of Oppenheim which views general principles of law as being inclusive of principles of private or municipal law when these are applicable to international relations. Where, in certain cases, there is no applicable treaty nor a generality of state practice giving rise to customary law, the international court is expected to rely upon certain legal notions of justice and equity in order to deduce a new rule for application to a novel situation. This reliance or borrowing by the international tribunal from general principles of municipal jurisprudence is explained in many ways by the fact that municipal or private law has a higher level of development compared to international law. Brownlee submits that the term generally accepted principles of international law could also refer to rules of customary law, to general principles of law, or to logical propositions resulting from judicial reasoning on the basis of existing international law and municipal law analogies. In order to qualify as a product of the subsidiary law-creating process, a principle of law must fulfill three requirements, 1. It must be a general principle of law as distinct from a legal rule of more limited functional scope, 2. It must be recognized by civilized nations. And, 3. It must be shared by a fair number of states in the community of nations. Clarifying the term generally accepted principles of international law during the deliberations of the 1987 Constitutional Commission, Commissioner Adolfo S. Age Cuna points out that when we talk of generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land, we mean that it is part of the statutory part of laws, not of the Constitution. The remark is shared by Professor Merlin M. Magalana who expresses that the phrase as part of the law of the land in the incorporation clause refers to the levels of legal rules below the Constitution such as legislative acts and judicial decisions. Thus, he contends, it is incorrect to so interpret this phrase as including the Constitution itself because it would mean that the generally accepted principles of international law falls in parity with the Constitution. 132, Emphasis Supplied, Citations Omitted, in Rubrico v. Arroyo, 133 Justice Conchita Carpio Morales, Justice Slash Morales, Refined Justice Vitag's Proposed Framework. She conceded the Constitution's mention of generally accepted principles of international law was not quite the same as, and was not specifically in Article 38's general principles of law recognized by civilized 134 yet, she noted, renowned publicist Ian Brownlee suggested, however that general principles of international law may refer to rules of customary law, to general principles of law as in Article 38, I, C, or to logical propositions resulting from judicial reasoning on the basis of existing international law and municipal analogies. Indeed, judicial reasoning has been underscoring the bedrock of Philippine jurisprudence on the determination of generally accepted principles of international law and consequent application of the incorporation clause. In Kuroda v. Jalandoni, the court held that while the Philippines was not a signatory to the Hague Convention and became a signatory to the Geneva Convention only in 1947, a Philippine military commission had jurisdiction over war crimes committed in violation of the two conventions before 1947. The court reasoned that the rules and regulations of the Hague and Geneva Conventions formed part of generally accepted principles of international law. Kuroda thus recognized that principles of customary international law do not cease to be so, and are in fact reinforced, when codified in multilateral treaties. 
in International School Alliance of Educators v. Quisuming, the court invalidated as discriminatory the practice of International School Incorporated of according foreign hires higher salaries than local hires. The court found that, among other things, there was a general principle against discrimination evidenced by a number of international conventions proscribing it, which had been incorporated as part of national laws through the constitution. The court thus subsumes within the rubric of generally accepted principles of international law both international custom and general principles of law, two distinct sources of international law recognized by the ICJ statute. 135, citations omitted, emphasis supplied, in other words, Justice Carpio Morales opined that, per jurisprudence, customs and general principles of law recognized by civilized phone part of the law of the land. Justice Antonio T. Carpio, in his dissent in Bayan Muna v. Romulo, 136 Justice Carpio Morales's supposition and further discussed, T. He doctrine of incorporation which mandates that the Philippines is bound by generally accepted principles of international law which automatically form part of Philippine law by operation of the Constitution. In Curota v. Jalandoni. This court held that this constitutional provision is not confined to the recognition of rules and principles of international law as contained in treaties to which our government may have been or shall be a signatory. The pertinent portion of Kuroda states, it cannot be denied that the rules and regulations of the Hague and Geneva Conventions form part of and are wholly based on the generally accepted principles of international law. Such rule and principles, therefore, form part of the law of our nation even if the Philippines was not a signatory to the conventions embodying them. For our constitution has been deliberately general and extensive in its scope and is not confined to the recognition of rules and principles of international law as contained in treaties to which our government may have been or shall be a signatory. Hence, generally accepted principles of international law form part of Philippine laws even if they do not derive from treaty obligations of the Philippines. Generally accepted principles of international law, as referred to in the Constitution, include customary international law. Customary international law is one of the primary sources of international law under Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. Customary international law consists of acts which, by repetition of states of similar international acts for a number of years, occur out of a sense of obligation, and taken by a significant number of states. It is based on custom, which is a clear and continuous habit of doing certain actions, which has grown under the aegis of the conviction that these actions are, according to international law, obligatory or right. Thus, customary international law requires the concurrence of two elements, 1j the established, widespread, and consistent practice on the part of the states, and 2 a psychological element known as opinion juris civ necessitatis, opinion as to law or necessity. Implicit in the latter element is a belief that the practice in question is rendered obligatory by the existence of a rule of law requiring it 137, emphasis supplied, citations omitted, thus, generally accepted principles of international law include customs and general principles of law. Under the incorporation these principles form part of the law of the land. And, by mere declaration, International law is deemed to have the force of domestic law 138 pursuant to Article 7, Section 21 of the Constitution. Treaties valid and effective upon the Senate's concurrence, the Senate's ratification of a treaty makes it legally effective and binding by transformation. It then has the force and effect of a statute enacted by Congress. In Pharmaceutical and Health Care Association of the Philippines v. Duca 3, ETAL, under the 1987 Constitution, international law can become part of the sphere of domestic law, either by transformation or incorporation. The transformation method requires that an international law be transformed into a domestic law through a constitutional mechanism such as local legislation. The incorporation method applies when, by mere constitutional declaration, international law is deemed to have the force of domestic law. Treaties become part of the law of the land through transformation pursuant to Article 7, Section 21 of the Constitution. Thus, 
treaties or conventional international law must go through a process prescribed by the constitution for it to be transformed into municipal law that can be applied to domestic conflicts. Point 139 as discussed in Bayan v. Zamora, 140 concurring MA treaty or agreement is, essentially legislative in character, the Sint, as an independent body possessed of its own erudite mind, has the prerogative to either accept or reject the proposed agreement. And whatever action it takes in the exercise of its wide latitude of discretion, pertains to the wisdom rather than the legality of the Act. 141 Thus, in doing so, the Senate partakes the principal, yet delicate, role in keeping the principles of separation of powers and of checks and balances alive and vigilantly ensures that these cherished rudiments remain true to their form in a democratic government such as ours. 142 However, the provision on treaty making is under Article 7 of the which concerns the Executive Department. A review of the of this constitutional provision may aid this court in interpreting text. In his concurring opinion in Intellectual Property Association of the V. Ochoa, 143 Justice Arturo D. Bryan, Justice Bryan, discussed antecedents of the transformation method, under the 1935 Constitution, the President has the power, with the concurrence of a majority of all the members of the National Assembly, to make treaties. The provision, Article 7, Section 11. Paragraph 7 is part of the enumeration of the President's powers under Section 11. A1 equal 7 of the 1935 Constitution. This recognition clearly marked treaty making to be an executive function, but its exercise was nevertheless subject to the concurrence of the National Assembly. A subsequent amendment to the 1935 Constitution, which divided the country's legislative branch into two houses, transferred the function of treaty concurrence to the Senate, and required that two thirds of its members assent to the treaty. By 1973, the Philippines adopted a presidential parliamentary system of government, which merged some of the functions of the executive and legislative branches of government in one branch. Despite this change, concurrence was still seen as necessary in the treaty-making process, as Article 8, Section 14 required that a treaty should be first concurred in by a majority of all members of the Batasang Pambansa before they could be considered valid and effective in the Philippines. Thus. SCC. 14. 1. Except as otherwise provided in this Constitution, no treaty shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by a majority of all the members of the Batasang Pambansa. This change in the provision on treaty ratification and concurrence is significant for the following reasons, first, the change clarified the effect of the lack of concurrence to a treaty, that is, a treaty without legislative concurrence shall not be valid and effective in the Philippines. Second, the change of wording also reflected the dual nature of the Philippines' approach in international relations. Under this approach, the Philippines sees international law and its international obligations from two perspectives, first, from the international plane, where international law reigns supreme over national laws, and second, from the domestic plane, where the international obligations and international customary laws are considered in the same footing as national laws, and do not necessarily prevail over the latter. The Philippines' treatment of international obligations as statutes in its domestic plane also means that they cannot contravene the Constitution, including the mandated process by which they become effective in Philippine jurisdiction. Thus, while a treaty ratified by the President is binding upon the Philippines in the international plane, it would need the concurrence of the legislature before it can be considered as valid and effective in the Philippine domestic jurisdiction. Prior to and even without concurrence, the treaty, once ratified, is valid and binding upon the Philippines in the international plane. But in order to take effect in the Philippine domestic plane, it would have to first undergo legislative concurrence as required under the Constitution. Third, that the PROV-1S10N had been couched in the negative emphasizes the mandatory nature of legislative concurrence before a treaty may be considered valid and effective in the Philippines. The phrasing of Article 8, Section 14 of the 1973 Constitution has been retained in the 1987 Constitution, except for three changes, first, the Batasang Pambansa has been changed to the Senate to reflect the current setup of our legislature and our tripartite system of government. Second, 
the vote required has been increased to two-thirds, reflective of the practice under the amended 1935 Constitution. Third, the term international agreement has been added, aside from the term treaty. Thus, aside from treaties, international agreements now need concurrence before being considered as valid and effective in the Philippines. 144, emphasis supplied, citations omitted, the 193, 5145 and 197, 3146 constitutions used the same words as Article Section 2147 of the present Constitution does and adopted the generally accepted principles of international law as part of the law of the land 148 however, there have been significant changes in constitutional provisions on Article 7. Section 10, 7, of the 193-5 Constitution reads, Section 10. Article 7 Executive Department, 7, the President shall have the power, with the concurrence of two-thirds O.F. all the members O.F. the Senate to make treaties, and with the consent of the Commission on Appointments. He shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls. He shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers duly accredited to the Government of the Philippines. Under the 193-5 Constitution, the power to make treaties was lodged in President, subject to the Senate's concurrence. Although the 1973 Constitution shifted our system of government from presidential to its provision on treaty-making still required the concurrence of the Batasang Pambansa, the body on which legislative power rested, Article 8 Batasang Pambansa Section 14. 1. Except as otherwise provided in this Constitution, no treaty shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by a majority of all the members of the Batasang Pambansa. Emphasis supplied, on this note, it has been previously surmised that, the concurrence of the Batasang Pambansa was duly limited to treaties. However, the first clause of this provision, except as otherwise provided, leaves room for the exception to the requirement of legislative concurrence. Under Article 14, Section 15 of the 1973 Constitution, requirements of national welfare and interest allow the President to enter into not only treaties but also international agreements without legislative concurrence. Thus, Article 14 The National Economy and the Patrimony of the Nation Triple X Triple X Triple X Section 15 any provision of paragraph 1, section 14, article 8, and of this article notwithstanding, the Prime Minister may enter into international treaties or agreements as the national welfare and interest may require. This court, in the recent case of Seguisig v. Executive Secretary, characterized this exception as having left a large margin of discretion that the President could use to bypass the legislature altogether. This court noticed this as a departure from the 1935 Constitution, which explicitly gave the President the power to enter into treaties only with the concurrence of the National Assembly. As in the 1935 Constitution, this exception is no longer present in the current formulation of the provision. The power and responsibility to enter into treaties is now shared by the executive and legislative departments. Furthermore, the role of the Legislative Department is expanded to cover not only treaties but international agreements in general as well, thus, Article 7 Executive Department Triple X Triple X Triple X Section 21. No treaty or international agreement shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by at least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate. In discussing the power of the Senate to concur with treaties entered into by the President, this court in Bayan v. Zamora remarked on the significance of this legislative power, for the role of the Senate in relation to treaties is essentially legislative in character, the Senate, as an independent body possessed of its own erudite mind, has the prerogative to either accept or reject the proposed agreement. And whatever action it takes in the exercise of its wide latitude of discretion, pertains to the wisdom rather than the legality of the act. In this sense, the Senate partakes a principle, yet delicate, role in keeping the principles of separation of powers and of checks and balances alive and vigilantly ensures that these cherished rudiments remain true to their form in a democratic government such as ours. The Constitution thus animates, through this treaty concurring power of the Senate, a healthy system of checks and balances indispensable toward our nation's pursuit of political maturity and growth. True enough, 
rudimentary is the principle that matters pertaining to the wisdom of a legislative act are beyond the ambit and province of the courts to inquire. Therefore, having an option does not necessarily mean absolute discretion on the choice of international agreement. There are certain national interest issues and policies covered by all sorts of international agreements, which may not be dealt with by the President alone. An interpretation that the executive has unlimited discretion to determine if an agreement requires Senate concurrence not only runs counter to the principle of checks and balances, it may also render the constitutional requirement of Senate concurrence meaningless, if executive agreement. Authority is uncontained, and if what may be the proper subject matter of a treaty may also be included within the scope of executive agreement power, the constitutional requirement of Senate concurrence could be rendered meaningless. The requirement could be circumvented by an expedient resort to executive agreement. The definite provision for Senate concurrence in the Constitution indomitably signifies that there must be a regime of national interests. Policies and problems which the executive branch of the government cannot deal with in terms of foreign relations except through treaties concurred in by the Senate under Article 7, Section 21 of the Constitution. The problem is how to define that regime, i.e., that which is outside the scope of executive agreement power of the President and which exclusively belongs to treaty-making as subject to Senate concurrence. Article 7, Section 21 does not limit the requirement of Senate concurrence to treaties alone. It may cover other international agreements, including those classified as executive agreements, if, 1, they are more permanent in nature, 2, their purposes go beyond the executive function of carrying out national policies and traditions and, 3, they amend existing treaties or statutes. As long as the subject matter of the agreement covers political issues and national policies of a more permanent character, the international agreement must be concurred in by the Senate. 149, emphasis supplied, citations omitted, the constitutional framers were not linguistically ignorant. Treaties a different process to become part of the law of the land. Their from generally accepted principles of international law was deliberate. So was the use of different terminologies and mechanisms in them valid and effective. In consonance with the Constitution and existing laws, presidents act their competence when they enter into treaties. However, for treaties be effective in this jurisdiction, Senate concurrence must be obtained. The may not engage in foreign relations in direct contravention of the Constitution and our laws, after the treaty is signed by the state's representative, the president, being accountable to the people, is burdened with the responsibility and the duty to carefully study the contents of the treaty and ensure that they are not inimical to the interest of the state and its people. 150 As explained in Pimentel, Jr., in our system of government, the president, being the head of state, is regarded as the sole organ and authority in external relations and is the country's sole representative with foreign nations. As the chief architect of foreign policy, the president acts as the country's mouthpiece with respect to international affairs. Hence, the president is vested with the authority to deal with foreign states and governments, extend or withhold recognition, maintain diplomatic relations, enter into treaties, and otherwise transact the business of foreign relations. In the realm of treaty-making, the president has the sole authority to negotiate with other states. Nonetheless, while the President has the sole authority to negotiate and enter into treaties. The Constitution provides a limitation to his power by requiring the concurrence of two-thirds of all the members of the Senate for the validity of the treaty entered into by him. The participation of the legislative branch in the treaty-making process was deemed essential to provide a check on the executive in the field of foreign relations. By requiring the concurrence of the legislature in the treaties entered into by the President, the Constitution ensures a healthy system of checks and balance necessary in the nation's pursuit of political maturity and growth. 151. Emphasis supplied, citations omitted, the context of the provision in question, alongside others, provides under Article 6 of the Constitution, legislative power is by the Executive, Section 23. 1. The Congress, by a vote of two-thirds of both houses in joint session assembled, voting separately, shall have the sole power to declare the existence of a state of war. 2. In times of war or other national emergency, the Congress may, by law, 
authorize the President, for a limited period and subject to such restrictions as it may prescribe, to exercise powers necessary and proper to carry out a declared national policy. Unless sooner withdrawn by resolution of the Congress, such powers shall cease upon the next adjournment thereof. Section 28. 1. The rule of taxation shall be uniform and equitable. The Congress shall evolve a progressive system of taxation. 2. The Congress may, by law, authorize the President to fix within specified limits, and subject to such limitations and restrictions as it may impose, tariff rates, import and export quotas, tonnage and wharfage dues, and other duties or imposts within the framework of the National Development Program of the Government. 3. Charitable institutions, churches, and parsonages or convents appurtenant thereto, mosques, non-profit cemeteries, and all lands, buildings, and improvements, actually, directly, and exclusively used for religious, charitable, or educational purposes shall be exempt from taxation. 4. No law granting any tax exemption shall be passed without the concurrence of a majority of all the members of the Congress. Conversely, some executive powers under Article 7 of the are checked by the legislature, by one of its chambers, by committees, or by other bodies attached to the legislature. Section 16. The President shall nominate and, with the consent of the Commission on Appointments, appoint the heads of the executive departments, ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, or officers of the armed forces from the rank of colonel or naval captain and other officers whose appointments are vested in him in this constitution. He shall also appoint all other officers of the government whose appointments are not otherwise provided for by law, and those whom he may be authorized by law to appoint. The Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of other officers lower in rank in the President alone, in the courts, or in the heads of departments, agencies, commissions, or boards. Section 18 the President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of all armed forces of the Philippines and whenever it becomes necessary, he may call out such armed forces to prevent or suppress lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion. In case of invasion or rebellion, when the public safety requires it, he may, for a period not exceeding sixty days, suspend the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus or place the Philippines or any part thereof under martial law. Within 48 hours from the proclamation of martial law or the suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus, the President shall submit a report in person or in writing to the Congress. The Congress, voting jointly, by a vote of at least a majority of all its members in regular or special session, may revoke such proclamation or suspension, which revocation shall not be set aside by the President. Upon the initiative of the President, the Congress may, in the same manner, extend such proclamation or suspension for a period to be determined by the Congress, if the invasion or rebellion shall persist and public safety requires it. The Congress, if not in session, shall, within twenty-four hours following such proclamation or suspension, convene in accordance with its rules without any need of a call. The Supreme Court may review, in an appropriate proceeding filed by any citizen, the sufficiency of the factual basis of the proclamation of martial law or the suspension of the privilege of the writ or the extension thereof, and must promulgate its decision thereon within thirty days from its filing. Section 19. Except in cases of impeachment, or as otherwise provided in this Constitution, the President may grant reprieves, commutations and pardons, and remit fines and forfeitures, after conviction by final judgment. He shall also have the power to grant amnesty with the concurrence of a majority of all the members of the Congress. Section 21. No treaty or international agreement shall be valid and effective unless concurred in by at least two-thirds of all the members of the Senate. Emphasis supplied, in sum, treaty-making is a function lodged in the executive branch, is headed by the President. Nevertheless, a treaty's effectivity on the Senate's concurrence, in accordance with the Constitution's system of checks and balances. 7. While Senate concurrence is expressly required to make treaties valid effective, no similar express mechanism concerning withdrawal from or international agreements is provided in the Constitution or any statute. Similarly, no constitutional or statutory provision grants the President the unilateral power to terminate treaties. 
This vacuum engenders controversy around which the present consolidated petitions revolve. Frameworks M Evaluating Executive Action, vis a vis legislative prerogatives, have been formulated in other jurisdictions. Discernment makes these frameworks worthy of consideration. Judicious to be clear, however, while legal principles in a legal system similar ours may hold persuasive value in our courts, we will not adopt such without considering our own unique cultural, political and economic contexts. The Philippines has long struggled against colonialism. We'll not betray efforts at evolving our own just but unique modalities for review by summarily adopting foreign notions. In Goldwater v. Carter, 152 A case resolved by the United States Supreme Court, certain members of Congress assailed then-President Jimmy Carter's, President Carter, unilateral abrogation of the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty. Relevant events were chronicled in a Yale Law article, on December 15, 1978, President Carter announced his intention to recognize and establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China and to terminate, as of January 1, 1980. The 1954 Mutual Defense Treaty between the United States and Taiwan Seven U.S. Senators and eight members of the House of Representatives sued the President and the Secretary of State in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. They sought an injunction and a declaration that the President's attempt to unilaterally terminate the treaty was unconstitutional, illegal, null, and void unless made by and with the full consultation of the entire Congress, and with either the advice and consent of the Senate, or the approval of both Houses of Congress. When the 96th Congress opened, several senators introduced resolutions asserting that the President had encroached on Congress's constitutional role with respect to treaty termination generally and the Taiwan Mutual Defense Treaty in particular. In October 1979, the District Court held that to be effective under the Constitution, the President's notice of termination had to receive the approval of either two-thirds of the Senate or a majority of both Houses of Congress. A fragmented D.C. Circuit, sitting and bank, heard the case on an expedited basis on November 13 and just 17 days later ruled for the President. Declining to treat the matter as a political question, the Circuit Court instead held on the merits that the President had not exceeded his authority in terminating the bilateral treaty in accordance with its terms. Pressed to decide the case before the designated January 1, 1980 termination date. The Supreme Court issued no majority opinion. Instead, in a 6-3 per curiam decision, the Court dismissed the complaint without oral argument as non-justiciable. 153, citations omitted, even back in 1979, before the case reached the United States Supreme Court. Circuit Court Judge McKinnon 154 had previously cautioned that a of absolute power of unilateral termination to the President may be used in the future to develop other excuses to feed upon congressional prerogatives that a Congress lacking in vigilance allows to into desuetude 155. The District Court eventually ruled that President Carter did not exceed his authority in terminating the bilateral agreement Senate concurrence. In a resolution, they United States Supreme Court granted the petition certiorari, vacated the Court of Appeals judgment, and remanded the case the District Court. With directions to dismiss the complaint 156 four justices observed that there is an absence of any constitutional governing the termination of a treaty and that different procedures may be appropriate for different treaties 157 observations articulated in Goldwater reveal stark similarities between the American and the Philippine legal systems concerning ensuing debates on the necessity of Senate concurrence in abrogating treaties, no constitutional PROV 1S 10N explicitly confers upon the President the power to terminate treaties. Further, Art. 2, 2, of the Constitution authorizes the President to make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. Article 6 provides that treaties shall be a part of the supreme law of the land. I has provisions add support to the view that the text of the Constitution does not unquestionably commit the power to terminate treaties to the President alone. We are asked to decide whether the President may terminate a treaty under the Constitution without Congressional approval. Resolution of the question may not be easy. But it only requires us to apply normal principles of interpretation to the constitutional provisions at issue.
The present case involves neither review of the President's activities as Commander-in-Chief nor impermissible interference in the field of foreign affairs. Such a case would arise if we were asked to decide, for example, whether a treaty required the President to order troops into a foreign country. But it is error to suppose that every case or controversy which touches foreign relations lies beyond judicial cognizance. This case touches foreign relations. But the question presented to us concerns only the constitutional division of power between Congress and the President. 158, citations omitted. Emphasis supplied, Yale Law School Professor Harold Hungju KOH 159, Professor KOH, opined that a President has no general unilateral power to terminate treaties, Senate concurrence on treaty abrogation is imperative. 160 He in future cases. The constitutional requirements for termination should be decided based on the type of agreement in question, the degree of congressional approval and subject matter in question, and Congress's effort to guide the termination and withdrawal process by framework legislation. 161. Emphasis Supplied Professor K.O.H. proposed the operation of what he dubbed as the where the degree of legislative approval needed to exit an international agreement must parallel the degree of legislative approval originally required to enter it. 162 He further said, under the mirror principle. The executive may terminate, without congressional participation, genuinely sole executive agreements that have lawfully been made without congressional input. But the President may not entirely exclude Congress from the withdrawal or termination process regarding congressional executive agreements or treaties that were initially concluded with considerable legislative input. That principle would make Congress's input necessary for disengagement even from such international agreements as the Paris Climate Agreement, which broadly implicate Congress's commerce powers and which while never subjected to an up or down vote were nevertheless enacted against a significant background of congressional awareness and support that implicitly authorized the presidential making, but not the unmaking, of climate change agreements. Congress also should participate in an attempt to withdraw the United States even from such political agreements as the Iran nuclear deal, also known as the Jake Po where the President is exercising plenary foreign commerce powers that were delegated by Congress and where the U.S. termination has now triggered actionable claims of violation of international law. 163, citations omitted, Professor K.O.H. considered that, as a functional matter, overboard executive power to terminate treaties risks presidents making hasty, partisan, or parochial withdrawals, thus weakening systemic stability as well as the credibility and negotiating leverage of all 164 the mirror principle echoes the points raised by Justice Robert H. Jackson's renowned concurrence 165 in the separation of powers case, Youngstown Sheet and Tube Co. v. Sawyer. 166 there, he laid down three of executive action as regards the necessity of concomitant action, Category 1 when the President acts pursuant to an express or implied authorization of Congress, his authority is at its maximum. For it includes all that he possesses in his own right plus all that Congress can delegate, Category 2, when the President acts in absence of either a congressional grant or denial of authority, he can only rely upon his own independent powers. But there is a zone of twilight in which he and Congress may have concurrent authority, or in which its distribution is uncertain, and Category 3, when the President takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, his power is at his lowest ebb. For then he cc one and rely only upon his own constitutional powers minus any constitutional powers of Congress over the matter. 167 This framework has since been dubbed as the Youngstown 168 and was adopted in subsequent American cases, among them v. Texas.169 Medellin involved a review of the president's power in foreign affairs. Tum, Medellin was considered in our jurisdiction by Chief Justice Renato S. Puno, Chief Justice Puno, in examining the constitutionality of the forces agreement. 17 degree Chief Justice Puno, opined, an examination of Bayan v. Zamora, which upheld the validity of the VFA is necessary in light of a recent change in U.S. policy on treaty enforcement. Of significance is the case of Medellin v. Texas, 
where it was held by the U.S. Supreme Court that while treaties entered into by the President with the concurrence of the Senate are binding international commitments, they are not domestic law unless Congress enacts implementing legislation or unless the treaty itself is self-executing. An Examination of Medellin v. Texas In Medellin v. Texas, José Ecobedo Medellín, Medellín, a Mexican national, was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death in Texas for the gang rape and brutal murders of two Houston teenagers. His conviction and sentence were affirmed on appeal. Medellin then filed an application for post-conviction relief and claimed that the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, Vienna Convention, accorded him the right to notify the Mexican consulate of his detention, and because the local law enforcement 11T officers failed to inform him of this right. He prayed for the grant of a new trial. The trial court, as affirmed by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, rejected the Vienna Convention claim. It was ruled that Medellin failed to show that any non-notification of the Mexican authorities impacted on the validity of his conviction or punishment. Medellin then filed his first habeas corpus petition in the Federal District Court, which also rejected his petition. It held that Medellin failed to show prejudice arising from the Vienna Convention. While Medellin's petition was pending, the International Court of Justice ICJ, issued its decision in the case concerning Avena and other Mexican nationals, Avena. The ICJ held that the U.S. violated Article 36, 1, b, of the Vienna Convention by failing to inform 51 named Mexican nationals, including Medellin, of their Vienna Convention rights. The ICJ ruled that those named individuals were entitled to a review and reconsideration of their U.S. state court convictions and sentences regardless of their failure to comply with generally applicable state rules governing challenges to criminal convictions. In Sanchez Lamas v. Oregon issued after Avena but involving individuals who were not named in the Avena judgment, Contrary to the ICJ's determination the U.S. Federal Supreme Court held that the Vienna Convention did not preclude the application of state default rules. The U.S. President, George W. Bush, then issued a memorandum, President's Memorandum, stating that the United States would discharge its international obligations under Avena by having state courts give effect to the decision. Relying on Avena and the President's Memorandum, Medellin filed a second Texas state court habeas corpus application, challenging his state capital murder conviction and death sentence on the ground that he had not been informed of his Vienna Convention rights. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals dismissed Medellin's application as an abuse of the writ, since under Texas law, a petition for habeas corpus may not be filed successively. And neither Avena nor the President's memorandum was binding federal law that could displace the state's limitations on filing successive habeas applications. Medellin repaired to the U.S. Supreme Court. In his petition, Medellin contends that the optional protocol, the United Nations Charter, and the ICJ statutes applied the relevant obligation to give the Avena judgment binding effect in the domestic courts of the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States ruled that neither Avena nor the President's memorandum constitutes directly enforceable federal law that preempts state limitations on the filing of successive habeas corpus petitions. It held that while an international treaty may constitute an international commitment, it is not binding domestic law unless Congress has enacted statutes implementing it or unless the treaty itself is self-executing. It further held that decisions of the ICJ are not binding domestic law and that, absent an act of Congress or constitutional authority, the U.S. President lacks the power to enforce international treaties or decisions of the ICJ. Requirements for Domestic Enforceability of Treaties In the U.S., the new ruling is clear-cut, while a treaty may constitute an international commitment. It is not binding domestic law unless Congress has enacted statutes implementing it or the treaty itself conveys an intention that it be self-executing and is ratified on that basis. The Avena judgment creates an international law obligation on the part of the United States. But it is not automatically binding domestic law because none of the relevant treaty sources, the optional protocol, the UN Charter, or the ICJ statute creates binding federal law in the absence of implementing legislation and no such legislation has been enacted. 
the court adopted a textual approach in determining whether the relevant treaty sources are self-executory. 171, Emphasis Supplied, Citations Omitted, Later, Seguisig v. Ochoa 172 reviewed the constitutionality of the defense cooperation agreement between the Republic of the Philippines and the United States of America. In Seguisig, Justice Bryan found the Youngstown framework to be a better approach than simply this court's position in one constitutional provision. He proposed examination of the President's Act in the context of how our system of government works, ENTRY into international agreements is a shared function among the three branches of government. In this light and in the context that the President's actions should be viewed under our tripartite system of government, I cannot agree with the Ponencia's assertion that the case should be examined solely and strictly through the constitutional limitation found in Article 8 Il Section 25 of the Constitution. 4.B, 2, Standards in Examining the President's Treaty-Making Powers Because the executive's foreign relations power operates within the larger constitutional framework of separation of powers, I find the examination of the President's actions through this larger framework to be the better approach in the present cases. This analytical framework, incidentally, is not the result of my original and independent thought, it was devised by U.S. Supreme Court Associate Justice Robert Jackson in his concurring opinion in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Co. 1. Sawyer Justice Jackson's framework for evaluating executive action categorizes the President's actions into three, first, when the President acts with authority from the Congress, his authority is at its maximum as it includes all the powers he possesses in his own right and everything that Congress can delegate. Second, when the President acts in the absence of either a congressional grant or denial of authority, he can only rely on his own independent powers, but there is a twilight zone where he and Congress may have concurrent authority, or where its distribution is uncertain. In this situation, presidential authority can derive support from congressional inertia, indifference, or quiescence. Third, when the President takes measures incompatible with the expressed or implied will of Congress, his power is at its lowest ebb. And the Court can sustain his actions only by disabling the Congress from acting upon the subject. This framework has been recently adopted by the U.S. Supreme Court in Medellin v. Texas, a case involving the President's foreign affairs powers and one that can be directly instructive in deciding the present case. In examining the validity of an executive act, the court takes into consideration the varying degrees of authority that the president possesses. Acts of the president with the authorization of Congress should have the widest latitude of judicial interpretation and should be supported by the strongest of presumptions. For the judiciary to overrule the executive action, it must decide that the government itself lacks the power. In contrast, executive acts that are without congressional imprimatur would have to be very carefully examined. 173, Emphasis in the original, citations omitted, the Youngstown framework was favorably considered and employed this court in its discussions in Gonzalez v. Marcos 174 penned by Chief Enrique M. Fernando. In Gonzalez, Ramon A. Gonzalez alleged that an issuing executive no. 30. The President encroached on the legislative prerogative when it created, a trust for the benefit of the Filipino people under the name and style of the Cultural Center of the Philippines entrusted with the task to construct a national theater, a national music hall, an arts building and facilities, to awaken our people's consciousness in the nation's cultural heritage and to encourage its assistance in the preservation, promotion, enhancement and development thereof, with the Board of Trustees to be appointed by the President. The center having as its underscore estate the real and personal property vested in it as well as donations received, financial commitments that could thereafter be collected, and gifts that may be forthcoming in the future. 175, citation omitted, however, during the pendency of the case, presidential decree no. 15 promulgated, creating the cultural center of the Philippines. This development prompted this court to dismiss the appeal. In so doing, this court proceeded to explain, 
it would be an unduly narrow or restrictive view of such a principle if the public funds that accrued by way of donation from the United States and financial contributions for the Cultural Center project could not be legally considered as governmental property. They may be acquired under the concept of dominium, the state as a persona slash in law not being deprived of such an attribute, thereafter to be administered by virtue of its prerogative of imperium. What is a more appropriate agency for assuring that they be not wasted or frittered away than the executive, the department precisely entrusted with management functions? It would thus appear that for the president to refrain from taking positive steps and await the action of the I then Congress could be tantamount to dereliction of duty. He had to act, time was of the essence. Delay was far from conducive to public interest. It was as simple as that. Certainly then, it could be only under the most strained construction of executive power to conclude that in taking the step he took, he transgressed on terrain constitutionally reserved for Congress. This is not to preclude legislative action in the premises. While to the presidency under the 1935 Constitution was entrusted the responsibility for administering public property, the then Congress could provide guidelines for such a task. Relevant in this connection is the excerpt from an opinion of Justice Jackson in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Co. v. Sawyer When the President acts in absence of either a congressional grant or denial of authority, he can only rely upon his own independent powers, but there is a zone of twilight in which he and Congress may have concurrent authority, or in which its distribution is uncertain. Therefore, congressional inertia, indifference or quiescence may sometimes, at least as a practical matter, enable, if not invite, measures on independent presidential responsibility. In this area, any actual test of power is likely to depend on, the imperative of events and contemporary imponderables rather than on abstract theories of law. To vary the phraseology, to recall Thomas Reed Powell. If Congress would continue to keep, its zero peace notwithstanding the, action taken by TIE Executive Department, it may be considered as silently vocal. In plainer language, it could be an instance of silence meaning consent. The executive order assailed was issued on June 25, 1966. Congress until the time of the filing of the petition on August 26, 1969 remained quiescent. Parenthetically, it may be observed that petitioner waited until almost the day of inaugurating the Cultural Center on September 11, 1969 before filing his petition in the lower court. However worthy of commendation was his resolute determination to keep the presidency within the bounds of its competence, it cannot be denied that the remedy, if any, could be submitted by Congress asserting itself in the Prun one Isas. Instead, there was apparent conformity on its part to the way the President saw fit to administer such government I property 176, emphasis supplied. Citations omitted, the Youngstown framework was also employed by Chief Justice Puno evaluating the situations subject of Chun v. Ozanir 177 and Akbayan v. 176 Aquino. In Bayan, Chief Justice Puno, citing the Youngstown framework, stated, the U.S. Supreme Court itself has intimated that the President act in external affairs without congressional authority, but not that he act contrary to an act of Congress. 179 He reiterated this in Akbayan. Thus, in appropriate cases, the validity of the President's actions there are countervailing legislative prerogatives may be appraised in light of the Youngstown framework. All told, the President, as primary architect of foreign policy, and enters into international agreements. However, the President's power is not absolute, but is checked by the Constitution, which Senate concurrence. Treaty-making is a power lodged in the executive, and is balanced by the legislative branch. The textual configuration of the Constitution harkens both to the basic separation of and to a system of checks and balances. Presidential discretion is but it is not underscore absolute. While no constitutional mechanism exists on how the Philippines withdraws from, an INTE national agreement, the unbridled discretion vis a vis treaty abrogation may run counter the basic prudence underlying the entire system of entry into and domestic operation of treaties. 8. 
The Mirror Principle and the Youngstown Framework are suitable points in reviewing the President's acts in the exercise of a power with the legislature, however, their concepts and methods cannot be adopted mechanically and indiscriminately. A compelling wisdom underlies them. But operationalizing them domestically requires careful consideration adjustment in view of circumstances unique to the Philippine context. The mirror principle is anchored on balancing executive action with extent of legislative participation in entering into treaties. It is sound logic to maintain that the same constitutional requirements of congressional approval which attended the effecting of treaties following original entry the must also be followed through their termination, as proposed by Chief Justices Fernando M. 1 D. Puno. Along with Justice the Dash 1 Jungstown framework may also guide us in reviewing executive action vis a vis the necessity of concomitant, legislative action in from treaties, when the President clearly shares power with legislatra. And yet Disayos treaties despite no accompanying action by Congress, the Youngstown framework considers this an instance when the relies exclusively on their limited independent powers. Thus, the of the withdrawal, the exercise of which should have been concurrent with Congress, must be critically examined. The basic, fact of powers being shared makes it difficult to sustain the unilateral action. Having laid out the parameters and underlying principles of relevant concepts, and considering our own historical experience and legal system, this court adopts the following guidelines as the modality for evaluating cases concerning the President's withdrawal from international agreements. First, the President enjoys some leeway in withdrawing from which he or she determines to be contrary to the Constitution or The Constitution is the fundamental law of the land. It mandates that to ensure that the laws be faithfully executed 180 both in negotiating and enforcing treaties, the President must ensure that all actions are in keeping with the Constitution and statutes. Accordingly, during negotiations, the President can insist on terms that are consistent with the Constitution and statutes, or refuse to pursue negotiations if those direction is such that the treaty will turn out to be repugnant to Constitution and our statutes. Moreover, the President should not be bound to abide by a treaty previously entered into, should it be established such treaty runs afoul of the Constitution and our statutes. There are treaties that implement mandates provided in the Constitution, such as human rights. Considering the circumstances of each period our nation encounters, there will be many means to acknowledge and strengthen existing constitutional mandates. Participating in and adhering to the creation of a body such as the International Criminal Court by becoming a party to the Rome Statute is one such means, but so is passing a law that, regardless of international relations, replicates many of the Rome Statute's provisions and even expands its protections. In such instances, it is not for this court absent concrete facts creating an actual controversy to make policy judgments as to which between a treaty and a statute is more effective, and thus, preferable. Within, the hierarchy of the Philippine legal system that is, as akin to statutes treaties cannot contravene the Constitution. Moreover, when repugnant to statutes enacted by Congress, treaties and international agreements must give way. Article 7, Section 21 provides for legislative involvement in making an international agreements valid and effective, that is, by making Senate concurrence a necessary condition. From this, Two points are discernible, one, that there is a difference in the extent of legislative in enacting laws as against rendering a treaty or international agreement valid and effective, and, two, that Senate concurrence, while a condition, is not in itself a sufficient condition for the validity and effectivity of treaties. In enacting laws, both Houses of Congress participate. A Bill 3 readings in each chamber. A bill passed by either chamber is scrutinized by the other, and both chambers consolidate their respective through a bicameral conference. Only after extensive participation by the people's elected representatives members of the Senate who are elected at large, and, those in the House of Representatives who represent districts or national, regional or sectoral party list organizations is a bill to the President for signature. In contrast, in the case of a treaty or international agreement, the President, or those acting under their authority, negotiates its terms. It is the finalized instrument that is presented to the Senate alone, and only for its concurrence. Following the President's signature, 
the Senate may either agree or disagree to the entirety of the treaty or international agreement. It cannot refine or modify the terms. It cannot improve what it deficient, or tame apparently excessive stipulations. The legislature's highly limited participation means that a treaty or agreement did not weather the rigors that attend regular lawmaking. It is true that an effective treaty underwent a special process one, of our two legislative chambers, but this also means that it bypassed the conventional Republican mill. Having passed scrutiny by hundreds of the peoples elected in two separate chambers which are committed by constitutional dictum to adopting legislation, statutes enacted by Congress carry greater democratic we one GHT than an agreement negotiated by a single person. This is true, even if that person is the chief executive who acts with the aid of unelected subalterns, this nuancing between treaties and international agreements, on one hand, and statutes on the other is an imperative borne by the Philippines' basic democratic and republican nature, the sovereignty that resides in the people is exercised through elected representatives. 181 Thus, a valid treaty or international agreement may be effective just as is effective. It has the force and effect of law. Still, statutes enjoy over international agreements. In case of conflict between a law and a treaty, it is the statute that must prevail. The second point proceeds from the first. The validity and effectivity of a treaty rests on its being in harmony with the Constitution and statutes. Constitution was ratified through a direct act of the sovereign Filipino voting in a plebiscite, statutes are adopted through concerted action their elected representatives. Senate concurrence is the formal act that a treaty or international agreement effective, but it is not, in substance, the sole criterion for validity and effectivity. Ultimately, a treaty conform to the Constitution and statutes. These premises give the President leeway, in withdrawing from that he or she determines to be contrary to the Constitution or statutes. In the EI rent that courts determine the unconstitutionality of a treaty, President may unilaterally withdraw from it. Owing to the preeminence of, statutes enacted by elected representatives and hurdling the rigorous legislative process, the subsequent enactment of a law that is inconsistent with a treaty likewise allows the to withdraw from that treaty. As the chief executive, the president swore to preserve and defend the and faithfully execute, laws. This includes the duty of appraising executive, action, and ensuring that treaties and international agreements are not inimical to public interest. The abrogation of treaties that inconsistent with the Constitution and statutes is in keeping with the duty to uphold the Constitution and our laws. Thus, even, sends a judicial determination that a treaty is the President also enjoys much leeway in withdrawing F from an agreement which, in his or her judgment, runs afoul of prior existing or the Constitution. In ensuring compliance with the Constitution and laws, the President performs his or her, sworn duty in, abrogating a treaty. That, his or her bona fide judgment, is not in accord with the Constitution or a law. Between this, and withdrawal owing to a prior judicial determination of unconstitutionality or repugnance to statute however, withdrawal under this basis may be relatively more susceptible of judicial challenge. This may be subject of judicial review, on whether there was grave abuse of discretion concerning the President's arbitrary, baseless, or whimsical determination of unconstitutionality or repugnance to statute. Second, the President cannot unilaterally withdraw from agreements entered into pursuant to Congressional imprimatur. The Constitution devised a system, of checks and balances in the exercise of powers among the branches of government. For instance, as a legislative check on executive power, Congress may authorize the President fix tariff rates, import and export quotas, tonnage and wharfage dues, and other duties or imposts subject to limitations and restrictions it may impose. 182 The President can likewise grant amnesty. But with the concurrence of a majority of all members of Congress. 183 Considering that affecting treaties is a shared function between the and the legislative branches. 184 Congress may expressly authorize President to enter into a treaty with conditions or limitations as to negotiating prerogatives. Similarly, a statute subsequently passed to implement a prior treaty signifies legislative, approbation of prior executive action, this lends greater to what would otherwise have been a course of action pursued through executive discretion. 
when such a statute is adopted, the President cannot withdraw from the treaty being implemented unless the statute itself is repealed. When a treaty was entered into upon Congress's express will, the may not unilaterally abrogate that treaty. In such an instance, the who signed the treaty simply implemented the law enacted by Congress. While the President performed his or her function as primary architect of international policy, it was in keeping with a statute. The had no sole authority, and the treaty negotiations were premised only upon his or her own diplomatic powers, but on the specific investiture made by Congress. This means that the President negotiated not out of his or her own volition, but with the express mandate of and more important, within the parameters that Congress has set. While this distinction is immaterial in international law, jurisprudence treated this as a class of executive agreements. To recall, an executive agreement implements an existing policy, and is entered to adjust the details of a treaty. Pursuant to or upon confirmation by an act of, the executive agreements hinge on prior constitutional or legislative authorizations 185 executive agreements inconsistent, with either a law or a treaty are considered ineffective. 186. Consistent, with the mirror principle, any withdrawal from an agreement must reflect how it was entered into. As the was entered pursuant to congressional imprimatur, withdrawal it must likewise be authorized by a law. Here, Congress passed Republic Act No. 9851 well ahead of the Senate's concurrence to the Rome Statute. Republic Act No. 9851 is broader the Rome Statute itself. This reveals not only an independent, but even a more encompassing legislative will even overtaking the course of international relations. Our elected representatives have seen it fit to enact a law that safeguards a broader scope of rights, regardless of whether the Philippines formally joins the International Criminal Court through accession to the Rome Statute. Third, the President cannot unilaterally withdraw from international where the Senate concurred and expressly declared that any must also be made with its concurrence. The Senate may concur with a treaty or international agreement expressly indicating a condition that withdrawal from it must likewise be its concurrence. It may be, embodied in the same resolution in which it expressed its concurrence. It may also be that the Senate eventually such a condition in a subsequent resolution. Encompassing action may also make it a general requirement for Senate concurrence to be obtained in any treaty abrogation. This may mean the Senate invoking its prerogative through legislative action taken in tandem the House of Representatives through a statute or joint resolution or by adopting, on its own, a comprehensive resolution. Regardless of the manner by which it is invoked, what controls is the Senate's exercise of its prerogative to impose concurrence as a condition. As affecting treaties is a shared function between the executive and legislative branches, the Senate's power to concur with treaties includes the power to impose conditions for its concurrence. The requirement of Senate concurrence may then be rendered meaningless if slash it is curtailed. Petitioner Senator Pangilinan manifested that the Senate has adopted this condition in other resolutions through which the Senate concurred with treaties. However, the Senate imposed no such condition when it concurred in the Philippines' accession to the Rome Statute. Likewise, the Senate has to pass a resolution indicating that its assent should have been obtained in withdrawing from the Rome Statute. While there was an attempt to pass a resolution, it has yet to be calendared, and thus, has no binding effect on the Senate as a collegial body. In sum, at no point and under no circumstances does the President enjoy unbridled authority to withdraw from treaties or international agreements. Any such withdrawal must be anchored on a determination that run afoul of the Constitution or a statute. Any such determination must have clear and definite basis, any wanton, arbitrary, whimsical, or capricious withdrawal is correctable by judicial review. Moreover, specific circumstances attending Congress's injunction on the executive to proceed in negotiation, or the Senate's specification of the need for its concurrence to be obtained in a withdrawal, binds the President and may him or her from proceeding with withdrawal. 9. It is wrong to state that matters of foreign relations are political and thus, beyond the judiciary's reach. The Constitution expressly states that this court, through its power of review, 
may declare any treaty or international agreement unconstitutional, Section 5. The Supreme Court shall have the following powers. 2. Review, revise, reverse, modify, or affirm on appeal or certiorari, as the law or the rules of court may provide, final judgments and orders of lower courts in, a, all cases in which the constitutionality or validity of any treaty, international or executive agreement, law, presidential decree, proclamation, order, instruction, ordinance, or regulation is in question. Point 187, emphasis supplied, we take this opportunity to clarify the pronouncements made in of, Justice v. Lanchon. 181, where this court summarized the rules courts are confronted with a conflict between a rule of international law and municipal law. It stated, the doctrine of incorporation is applied whenever Monk 1 Pa 1 tribunals, or local courts, are confronted with situations in which there appears to be a conflict between a rule of international law and the provisions of the constitution or statute of the local state. Efforts should first be exerted to harmonize them, so as to, give effect to both since it is to be presumed. That municipal law was enacted with proper regard, for the generally accepted principles of international law in observance of the observance of the incorporation clause in the above cited constitutional provision. In a situation, however, where the conflict is irreconcilable and a choice has to be made between a rule of international law and municipal law, jurisprudence dictates that municipal law should be upheld by the municipal courts. For the reason that such courts are organs of municipal law and are accordingly bound by it in all circumstances. The fact that international law has been made part of the law of the land does not pertain to or imply the primacy of international law over national or municipal law in 6.e municipal sphere. The doctrine of incorporation, as applied in most countries, decrees that rules of international law are given equal standing with, but are not superior to, national legislative enactments. Accordingly, the principle lex posterior derogat priori takes effect a treaty may repeal a statute and a statute may repeal a treaty. In states where the constitution is the highest law of the land, such as the Republic of the Philippines, both statutes and treaties may be invalidated if they are in conflict with the constitution. 189, citations omitted, Lanchon discussed the incorporation doctrine embodied in Article 2, 2 of the constitution. Through incorporation, the Philippines adopts custom and general principles of law as part of the law of the land. Lanchon clarified that despite being part of the legal system, this does pertain to or imply the primacy of international law over national or law in the municipal sphere 190. However, it goes on to state that posterior derogat priori takes effect a treaty may repeal a statute and a statute may repeal a treaty, 191 previously. We have extensively discussed how, despite being both sources of international law, treaties must be distinguished from generally accepted principles of international law. Article 2. Section 2 automatically incorporates generally accepted principles of international law into the domestic sphere. On the other hand, Artide 7, Section 21 operates differently and concerns an entirely distinct source of international law. It signifies that treaties and international agreements are not automatically incorporated to the Philippine legal system, but are transformed into law by Senate concurrence. Thus, Lanchon's pronouncement that lex posterior derogat priori takes effect a treaty may repeal a statute and a statute may repeal a treaty 192-- is misplaced and unsupported by its internal logic. Its fallacy frustrates its viability as precedent besides, it was mere obiter dictum as this court did not even rule on the constitutionality of the assailed Republic of the Philippines United States Extradition Treaty. Courts, in which judicial power is vested, may void executive and acts when they violate the Constitution. 193 The President is the head of state and chief executive. The mandates that in performing his or her functions, the President ensure that the laws be faithfully executed 194 Thus, upon assuming office, a President swears to faithfully and conscientiously fulfill my duties. Preserve and defend the Constitution, execute, laws, do justice to every man, and consecrate myself to the service of the nation 195 Accordingly, in fulfilling his or her functions as primary architect of policy, 
and in negotiating and enforcing treaties. All of the actions must always be within the bounds of the Constitution and our laws. This mandate is exceeded when acting outside what the Constitution or our laws allow. When any such excess is so grave, arbitrary, or attended by bad faith, it can be invalidated through review. X. The petitions here raise interesting legal questions. However, the factual backdrop of these consolidated cases renders inopportune a ruling on the issues presented to this court. Separation of powers is fundamental in our legal system. The Constitution delineated the powers among the legislative, executive, and branches of the government. With each having autonomy and supremacy within its own sphere. 196 This is moderated by a system of checks and balances carefully calibrated by the Constitution to temper the official Acts 9 of each branch. 197 Among the three dot branches, the judiciary was designated as the arbiter slash in allocating constitutional boundaries. 198 Judicial power is defined in Article 8, Section L of the Constitution as, Section 1. The judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such lower courts as may be established by law. Judicial power includes the duty of the courts of justice to settle actual controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and, enforceable. And to determine whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. A plain reading of the Constitution identifies two instances when power is exercised, 1. In settling actual controversies involving rights which are legally demandable and enforceable, and, 2. In determining whether or not there has been a grave abuse of discretion amounting to a lack or excess of jurisdiction on the part of any branch or instrumentality of the government. In justifying judicial review in its traditional sense, Justice Jose P. In Angara v. Electoral Commission 199 underscored that when this court allocates constitutional boundaries, it neither asserts supremacy nor annuls the legislature's acts. It simply carries out the obligations that the Constitution imposed upon it to determine dot conflicting claims and to establish rights in an actual controversy. The Constitution is a definition of the powers of government. Who is to determine the nature, scope, and extent of such powers? The Constitution itself has provided for the instrumentality of the judiciary as the rational way. And when the judiciary mediates to allocate constitutional boundaries, it does not assert any superiority over the other departments, it does not in reality nullify or invalidate an act of the legislature. But only asserts the solemn and sacred obligation assigned to it by the Constitution to determine conflicting claims of authority under the Constitution and to establish for the parties in an actual controversy the rights which that instrument secures and guarantees to them. This is in truth all that is involved in what is termed judicial supremacy which properly is the power of judicial review under the Constitution. 200 The latter conception of judicial power that jurisprudence refers to as expanded certiorari jurisdiction 201 was an innovation of the 1987 Constitution, 202 This situation changed after 1987 when the new Constitution expanded the scope of judicial power. In Francisco v. The House of Representatives, we recognized that this expanded jurisdiction was meant to ensure the potency of the power of judicial review to curb grave abuse of discretion by any branch or instrumentalities of government. Thus, the second paragraph of Article 8, Section 1 engraves, for the first time in its history, into black-letter law the expanded certiorari jurisdiction of this court, whose nature and purpose had been provided in the sponsorship speech of its proponent former Chief Justice Constitutional Commissioner Roberto Concepcion. Meanwhile that no specific procedural rule has been promulgated to enforce this expanded constitutional definition of judicial power and because of the commonality of grave abuse of discretion as a ground for review under Rule 65 and the Court's expanded jurisdiction. The Supreme Court based on its power to relax its rules allowed Rule 65 to be used as the medium for petitions invoking the Court's expanded jurisdiction based on its power to relax its rules. This is however an ad hoc approach that does not fully consider the accompanying implications, among them, 
that Rule 65 is an essentially distinct remedy that cannot simply be bodily lifted for application under the judicial power's expanded mode. The terms of Rule 65, too, are not fully aligned with what the Court's expanded jurisdiction signifies and requires. On the basis of almost 30 years' experience with the Court's expanded jurisdiction, the Court should not fully recognize the attendant distinctions and should be aware that the continued use of Rule 65 on an ad hoc basis as the operational remedy, in implementing its expanded jurisdiction may, in the longer term, result in, problems of uneven, misguided, or even incorrect application of the Court's expanded mandate. 203 Tanada v. Ongara 204 characterized this not only as a power, but as a ordained by the Constitution, it is an innovation in our political law. As explained by former Chief Justice Roberto Concepcion the judiciary is the final arbiter of the Questi 6N of whether or not a branch of government or any of its officials has acted without jurisdiction or in excess of jurisdiction or so capriciously as to constitute an abuse of discretion. Amounting to excess of jurisdiction this is not only a judicial power but a duty to pass judgment on matters of this nature. As this court has repeatedly and firmly one emphasized in many cases, it will not shirk, digress from or abandon its sacred duty and authority to uphold the Constitution in matters that involve grave abuse of discretion brought before it in appropriate cases, committed by any officer, agency, instrumentality, or department of the government. 205. Emphasis Supplied Citations omitted, despite its expansion, judicial review has its limits. In deciding involving grave abuse of discretion, courts, cannot brush aside the requisite of an actual case or controversy. The clause articulating expanded certiorari jurisdiction requires a prima facie showing of grave abuse of discretion in the assailed governmental act which, in essence, is the actual or controversy. Thus, even now, under the regime of the textually power of judicial review articulated in Article 8, Section 1 of 1987 Constitution, the requirement of an actual case or controversy is not dispensed with. 206 In Provincial Bus, Operators Association of the Philippines v. Department of Labor and Employment 207 An actual case or controversy is one which involves a conflict of legal rights, an assertion of opposite legal claims susceptible of judicial resolution. A case is justiciable if the issues presented are definite and concrete. Touching on the legal relations of parties having adverse legal interests, the conflict must be ripe for judicial determination, not conjectural or anticipatory, otherwise, this court's decision will amount to an advisory opinion concerning legislative or executive action. Even the expanded jurisdiction of this court under Article 8, Section 1 does not provide license to provide advisory opinions. An advisory opinion is one where the factual setting is conjectural or hypothetical. In such cases, the conflict will not have sufficient concreteness or adversariness so as to constrain the discretion of this court. After all, legal arguments from concretely lived facts are chosen narrowly by the parties. Those who bring theoretical cases will have no such limits. They can argue up to the level of absurdity. They will bind the future parties who may have more motives to choose specific legal arguments. In other words, for there to be a real conflict between the parties, there must exist actual facts from which courts can properly determine whether there has been a breach of constitutional text. 208 Thus, whether in its traditional or expanded scope, the exercise of review requires the concurrence of these requisites for justiciability, a. There must be an actual case or controversy calling for the exercise of judicial power, b. The person challenging the act must have the standing to question the validity of the subject act or issuance, c. The question of constitutionality must be raised at the earliest opportunity, and, d. The issue of constitutionality must be the very ismota of the case. 209, citations omitted, 11. The petitions are moot. They fail to present a persisting case or that impels this court's review. In resolving constitutional issues, there must be an existing case or controversy that is appropriate or ripe for determination, 
not conjectural or 210 an actual case deals with conflicting rights that are legally demandable and enforceable. It involves definite facts and incidents to be and laws to be applied, interpreted and enforced vis a vis ascertained facts. It must be definite and concrete, touching the legal of parties having adverse legal interest, a real and substantial controversy admitting of specific relief. 211 A constitutional question may not be presented to this court at an inopportune time. When it is premature, this court's ruling shall be as an advisory opinion for a potential, future occurrence. When belated, concerning matters that are moot, the decision will no longer affect the parties. Either way, courts must avoid resolving hypothetical problems or academic questions. This exercise of judicial restraint ensures that the judiciary will not encroach on the powers of other branches of government. As Angara v. Electoral Commission 212 explained, Dash 1T His power of judicial review is limited to actual cases and controversies to be exercised after full opportunity of argument by the parties, and limited further to the constitutional question raised or the very lis mola presented. Any attempt at abstraction could only lead to dialectics and barren legal questions and to sterile conclusions of wisdom, justice, or expediency of legislation. More than that, courts accord the presumption of constitutionality to legislative enactments. Not only because the legislature is presumed to abide by the Constitution but also because the judiciary in the determination of actual cases and controversies must reflect the wisdom and justice of the people as expressed through their representatives in the executive and legislative departments of the government. 213 The requirement of a bona fide controversy precludes advisory and judicial legislation, for this court, only constitutional issues that are narrowly framed sufficient to resolve an actual case, may be entertained, 214 and only when they are raised at the opportune time. A case is moot when it ceases to present a justiciable controversy by of supervening events, so that a declaration thereon would be of no practical use or value 215, there may have been conflicting rights, disputed facts or meritorious claims warranting this court's intervention. But a supervening event rendered the issue stale. In Penafrancia Sugar Mill Inc. Sugar Regulatory Administration 216, a case or issue is considered moot and academic when it ceases to present a justiciable controversy by virtue of supervening events, so that an adjudication of the case or a declaration on the issue would be of no practical value or use. In such instance, there is no actual substantial relief which a petitioner would be entitled to, and which would be negated by the dismissal of the petition. Courts generally decline jurisdiction over such case or dismiss it on the ground of mootness. This is because the judgment will not serve any useful purpose or have any practical legal effect because, in the nature of things, it cannot be enforced. 217, Citations Omitted, on March 19, 2019, the International Criminal Court itself, through Ogon Kwan, the President of the Assembly of States Parties, announced the Philippines' departure from the Rome Statute effective March 1, 7, 2019. It made this declaration with regret and the hope that such departure is only temporary and that it will rejoin the Rome Statute family the future. 218 This declaration, coming from the International Court itself, settles doubt on whether there are lingering factual occurrences that may be no longer is there an unsettled incident demanding resolution. Discussion on the Philippines' withdrawal is, at this juncture, merely a of theory. However, even prior to the filing of these petitions 219 the President already completed the irreversible act of withdrawing from the Rome Statute. To reiterate, Article 127, 1, of Ply Rome Statute provides the on how its state parties may withdraw, a state party may, by written notification addressed to the Secretary-General of the United Nations withdraw from this statute. The withdrawal shall take effect one year after the date of receipt of the notification, unless the notification specifies a later date. The Philippines announced its withdrawal from the Rome Statute on March 15, 2018, and formally submitted its notice of withdrawal through a note verbal to the United Nations Secretary-General's Chef de Cabinet on March 16, 2018. The Secretary-General received the notification on March 17, 2018. 
for all intents and purposes, and in keeping with what the Rome Statute plainly requires, the Philippines had, by then, completed all the requisite acts of withdrawal. The Philippines has done all that were needed to facilitate the withdrawal. Any subsequent discussion would to matters that are fait accompli. On March 20, 2018, the International Criminal Court issued a statement on the Philippines' notice of withdrawal. The United Nations certified that the Philippines deposited the written notification on March 17, 2018. It stressed that while withdrawal from the Rome Statute is a sovereign decision, it has no impact on any pending proceedings. 220 In any case, the International Criminal Court expressed no reservation on the efficacy of the withdrawal. At that point, this court's interference and ruling on what course of action to take would mean an imposition of its will not only on the executive, but also on the International Criminal Court itself. That is not the function of this court, which takes on a passive role in resolving actual controversies when proper parties raise them at an opportune time. In the international arena, it is the president that has the authority to conduct foreign relations and represent the country. This court cannot encroach on beyond its jurisdiction. Moreover, while its text provides a mechanism on how to withdraw slash it, the Rome Statute does not have any proviso on the reversal of a state withdrawal. We fail to see how this court can revoke as what are in effect asking us to do the country's withdrawal from the Rome Statute, without writing new terms into the Rome Statute. Petitioners harp on the withdrawal's effectivity which was one year from the United Nations Secretary-General's receipt of the notification. This one-year period only pertains to the effectivity, or when exactly the legal consequences of the withdrawal takes effect. It neither approval nor finality of the withdrawal. Parenthetically, this one period does not undermine or diminish the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction and power to continue a probe that it has commenced while a state was a party to the Rome Statute. Here the withdrawal has been communicated and accepted, and there are no means to retract it. This court cannot extend the reliefs that seek. The Philippines's withdrawal from the Rome Statute has been properly received and acknowledged by the United Nations Secretary-General, and has taken effect. These are all that the Rome Statute entails, and these are all that the international community would require for a valid withdrawal. Having been consummated, these actions bind the Philippines. In GR No. 238,875, petitioners posit, if the executive can unilaterally withdraw from any treaty or international agreement, he is in a position to abrogate some of the basic norms in our legal system. Thus, the executive can unilaterally withdraw from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Geneva Conventions, and the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, without any checking mechanism from Congress. This would be an undemocratic concentration of power in the executive that could not have been contemplated by the Constitution. 221 We reiterate that courts may only rule on an actual case. This court no jurisdiction to rule on matters that are abstract, hypothetical, or potential. Petitioners fear that the President may unilaterally withdraw from other treaties has not transpired and cannot be taken cognizance of by this court in this case. We have the duty to determine we should stay our hand, and refuse to rule on cases where the issues are speculative and theoretical, and consequently, not justiciable. 222 Legislative and executive powers impel the concerned branches of into assuming a more proactive role in our constitutional order. Judicial power, on the other hand, limits this court into taking a passive slash stance. Such is the consequence of separation of powers. Until an actual is brought before us by the proper parties at the opportune time, where constitutional question is the very lis mota, we cannot act on an issue, no matter how much it agonizes us. 12. Parties have standing if they stand to be benefited if the case is in their favor, or if they shall suffer should the case be decided against them. 223 in Falsus 3 v. Civil Registrar General, 224. This court explained much like the requirement of an actual case or controversy. Legal standing ensures that a party is seeking a concrete outcome or relief that may be granted by courts, 
legal standing or locus standi is the right of appearance in a court of justice on a given question. To possess legal standing, parties must show a personal and substantial interest in the case such that they have sustained or will sustain direct injury as a result of the governmental act that is being challenged. The requirement of direct injury guarantees that the party who brings suit has such personal stake in the outcome of the controversy and, in effect, assures that concrete adverseness which sharpens the presentation of issues upon which the court depends for illumination of difficult constitutional questions. The requirements of legal standing and the recently discussed actual case and controversy are both built on the principle of separation of powers sparing as it does unnecessary interference or invalidation by the judicial branch of the actions rendered by its co-equal branches of government. In addition, economic reasons justify the rule. Thus, a lesser but hot insignificant reason for screening the standing of persons who desire to litigate constitutional issues, is economic in character. Given the sparseness of our resources, the capacity of courts to render efficient judicial service to our people is severely limited. For courts to indiscriminately open their doors to all types of suits and suitors is for them to unduly overburden their dockets, and ultimately render themselves ineffective dispensers of justice. To be sure, this is an evil that clearly confronts our judiciary today. Standing in private suits requires that actions be prosecuted or defended in the name of the real party in interest, interest being material interest or an interest in issue to be affected by the decree or judgment of the case common not just mere curiosity about the question involved. Whether a suit is public or private, the parties must have a present substantial interest, not a mere expectancy or a future, contingent, subordinate, or consequential interest. Those who bring the suit must possess their own right to the relief sought. Even for exceptional suits, filed by taxpayers, legislators, or concerned citizens, this court has noted that the party must claim some kind of injury in fact. 225, citations omitted, in GR No. 238,875, petitioners senators were then incumbent senators who alleged that the Senate's constitutional prerogative to and the government's decision to withdraw from the Rome Statute has impaired. They add that they were likewise suing as citizens as this case allegedly involves a public right and its object, is to procure the enforcement of a public duty to 26 petitioners senators. Also claim that the issue has transcendental which may potentially impact constitutional checks in our domestic legal system, and the country's relations with the community. 227. In GR No. 239,483, Pet 1T10 of Philippine Coalition for the Criminal Court and its individual members assert that, as citizens and as human beings, they have rights to life and personal security. The withdrawal from the Rome Statute, they claim, violates their to ample remedies for the protection of their rights, and of their other fundamental rights, especially the right to life. 228 They likewise contend that their petition is a taxpayer's suit. Since the department spent substantial taxpayers' money in attending and in participating in the drafting of what would be the Roy E. Statute.229, in GR. No. 240,954, the integrated bar of the Philippines comes to court on essentially the same ground, as a group of concerned citizens, it invokes its members' right to life and due process that may be affected by the withdrawal. Additionally, it claims that as a body that aims to uphold the rule of law, it has standing to the question whether the withdrawal was 230. Jurisprudence has consistently recognized each legislator's individual standing and prerogative independent of the House of Representatives or the Senate as a collegial body. 231A legislator's individual standing and prerogative remains and is not abandoned in this case. However, the precise circumstances here subvert the otherwise generally recognized standing anchors the individual legislator's capacity to seek relief. Here, the Senate's inaction makes premature petitioners' senators' capacity to seek the Senate's institutional reticence subverts the capacities otherwise properly accruing to petitioners' senators. The Senate has refrained from passing a resolution indicating that its assent should have been obtained in withdrawing from the Rome Statute. Senate Resolution No. 
289,232 or the resolution expressing the sense of the Senate that termination of, or withdrawal from, treaties and international concurred in by the Senate shall be valid and effective only upon concurrence by the Senate, has been presented to but, thus far, never by the Senate. During the September 4, 2018 oral arguments, Petitioner Senator himself manifested the resolution's pendency, which he claimed was not rejected. But was not calendared for adoption 233 thus, Senate Resolution No. 289 has absolutely no legal effect. Such reticence on this means that, as a collegial body, and in its wisdom, the Senate has chosen not to assert any right or prerogative which it may feel pertains to it, if any, to limit, balance, or otherwise inhibit the President's Act. The Passage of Resolution No. 289 would have been a definite basis which petitioner's senators can claim a right. However, the Senate itself to have not seen the need for it. Thus, petitioner's senators cannot come. To this court with a case that is already foreclosed by their own institutions in action. Moreover, as discussed petitioner Senator Pangalina and mentioned oral arguments that the Senate, has passed 17 resolutions concurring different treaties, each of which came with a clause that specifically its concurrence for withdrawal 234 in contrast. No similar clause contained in Senate Resolution No. 546,235 through which the Senate ratified the Rome Statute. Thus, the Senate's inaction itself precludes a source from which petitioner's senators could claim a right to require Senate concurrence to withdrawing from the Rome Statute. Incidentally, in Goldwater, the United States Supreme Court also declined to rule on the substance of the case. There, then-Senator Barry Goldwater and other Congress members assailed then-President Carter's nullification of the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty, claiming that this should have required Senate concurrence. However, Congress had not formally taken a stance contrary to the President's action any resolution. There was a draft Senate resolution. But no vote was on it. Point 236 Justice Powell noted, This court has recognized that an issue should not be decided if it is not ripe for judicial review. Prudential considerations persuade me that a dispute between Congress and the President is not ready for judicial review unless and until each branch has taken action asserting its constitutional authority. Differences between the President and the Congress are commonplace under our system. The differences should, and almost invariably do, turn on political, rather than legal, considerations. The judicial branch should not decide issues affecting the allocation of power between the President and Congress until the political branches reach a constitutional impasse. Otherwise, we would encourage small groups, or even individual members, of Congress to seek judicial resolution of issues before the normal political process has the opportunity to resolve the conflict. In this case, a few members of Congress claim that the President's action in terminating the treaty with Taiwan has deprived them of their constitutional role with respect to a change in the supreme law of the land. Congress has taken no official action. In the present posture of this case, we do not know whether there ever will be an actual confrontation between the legislative and executive branches. Although the Senate has considered a resolution declaring that Senate approval is necessary for the termination of any mutual defense treaty, no final vote has been taken on the resolution. Moreover, it is unclear whether the resolution would have retroactive effect. It cannot be said that either the Senate or the House has rejected the President's claim. If the Congress chooses not to confront the President, it is not our task to do so. 237, emphasis supplied. Citations omitted, similarly, this court should stay its hand when the Senate itself, as a body, has not officially confronted the President's Act. This is in keeping with the limits of judicial review. Oh, the other hand. Persons invoking their rights as citizens must satisfy the following requisites to file a suit, 1. They, must have personally suffered some actual or threatened injury as a result of the allegedly illegal conduct of government, 2. The injury is fairly traceable to the challenged end, 3. The injury is likely to be redressed by a favorable action 238 in GRNOS. 239,483 and
240,954, what petitioners assail is an act of the President, in the exercise, of his executive power. They failed to show the actual or imminent injury that they sustained as a result of the President's withdrawal from the Rome Statute. Again, whether a suit is public or the parties, must have a present substantial interest, not a mere expectancy or a future, contingent, subordinate, or consequential interest. 239 Similarly, petitioners have no standing as taxpayers. In cases involving expenditure of public funds, also known as a taxpayer's suit, must be a claim of illegal disbursement of public funds or that the tax is unconstitutional. 240 petitioners here failed to show any illegal expenditure of public funds. Allow these petitioners who suffer no injury to invoke this court's discretion would be to allow everyone to come to courts on the flimsiest of parties must possess their own right to the relief sought and a general of citizens or a taxpayer's rights is insufficient. This court must indiscriminately open its doors to every person urging it to take cognizance of a case where they have no demonstrable injury. This may ultimately render this court ineffective to dispense justice as cases clog its docket. 241. This court has also recognized that an association may file petitions behalf of its members on the basis of third-party standing. However, to do so, the association must meet the following requirements, 1, the party suit must have suffered an injury in fact, thus giving it a sufficiently concrete interest in the outcome of the issue in dispute, 2, party must have a close relation to the third party, and, 3, there must exist some hindrance to the third party's ability to protect his or her own interests. 242, in Pharmaceutical and Health Care Association of the Philippines v. of Health 243 this court found that an association has the legal personality to represent its members because the results of the case will affect their vital interests. 244. The dot modern view. Fuses the legal identity of an association with that of its members. An association has standing to file suit for its workers despite its lack of direct interest if its members are affected by the action. An organization has standing to assert the concerns of its constituents. We note that, under its Articles of Incorporation, the respondent was organized, to act as the representative of any individual, company, entity or association on matters related to the manpower recruitment industry and to perform other acts and activities necessary to accomplish the purposes embodied therein. The respondent is, thus, the appropriate party to assert the rights of its members, because it and its members are in every practical sense identical. The respondent association is but the medium through which its individual members seek to make more effective the expression of their voices and the redress of their grievances. 245 in Provincial Bus Operators Association of the Philippines 246 This did not allow the Association of Bus Operators to represent its members. There were no board resolutions or articles of incorporation to show that it was authorized to file the petition on the members' behalf. Some of the associations even had their certificates of incorporation revoked. This court ruled that it is insufficient to simply allege that they are associations that represent their members who will be directly injured by the implementation of a law, the Associations in Pharmaceutical and Health Care Association of the Philippines, Holy Spirit Homeowners Association Inc. And the Executive Secretary were allowed to sue on behalf of their members because they sufficiently established who their members were, that their members authorized the associations to sue on their behalf and that the members could be directly injured by the challenged governmental acts. The liberality of this court to grant standing for associations or corporations whose members are those who suffer direct and substantial injury depends on a few factors. In all these cases, there must be an actual controversy. Furthermore, there should also be a clear and convincing demonstration of special reasons why the truly injured parties may not be able to sue. Alternatively, there must be a similarly clear and convincing demonstration that the representation of the association is more efficient for the petitioners to bring. They must further show that it is more efficient for this court to hear only one voice from the association. In other words, the association should show special reasons for bringing the action themselves rather than as a class suit, allowed, when the subject matter of the controversy is one of common or general interest to many persons. 
In a class suit, a number of the members of the class are permitted to sue and to defend for the benefit of all the members so long as they are sufficiently numerous and representative of the class to which they belong. LN Some circumstances similar to those in white light, the third parties represented by the petitioner would have special and legitimate reasons why they may not bring the action themselves. Understandably, the cost to patrons in the white light case to bring the action themselves i.e., the amount they would pay for the lease of the motels will be too small compared with the cost of the suit. But viewed in another way, whoever among the patrons files the case even for its transcendental interest endows benefits on a substantial number of interested parties without recovering their costs. This is the free rider problem in economics. It is a negative externality which operates as a disincentive to sue and assert a transcendental right. 247, citation omitted, emphasis supplied, here, both petitioners' associations, the Integrated Bar of the and the Philippine Coalition for the International Criminal Court, failed to convince this court why they must be heard as associations. Human rights as an institution is insufficient. No special reason alleged, let alone proved why its allegedly injured members may not file the case themselves. Worse, the members of the Philippine Coalition for the International Criminal Court joined the case as petitioners, albeit likewise failing to exhibit actual or imminent injury from which they stand to suffer. Dash 13. Transcendental importance is often invoked in instances when the fail to establish standing in accordance with customary requirements. However, its general invocation cannot negate the of locus standi. Facts must be undisputed, only legal issues must be present and proper and sufficient justifications why this court should not simply stay its hand must be clear. Falsus explained. Diocese of Bacolod recognized transcendental importance as an exception to the doctrine of hierarchy of courts. In cases of transcendental importance, Imminent and clear threats to constitutional rights warrant a direct resort to this court. This was clarified in Joe Samar. There, this court emphasized that transcendental importance, originally cited to relax rules on legal standing arid not as an exception to the doctrine of hierarchy of courts applies only to eases with purely legal issues. We explained that the decisive factor in whether this court should permit the invocation of transcendental importance is not merely the presence of special and important reasons, comma, but the nature of the question presented by the parties. This court declared that there must be no disputed facts, and the issues raised should only be questions of law. W. Hen a question before the court involves determination of a factual issue indispensable to the resolution of the legal issue the court will refuse to resolve the question regardless of the allegation or invocation of compelling reasons, such as the transcendental or paramount importance of the case. Such question must first be brought before the proper trial courts or the CA, both of which are specially equipped to try and resolve factual questions. Still, it does not follow that this court should proceed to exercise its power of judicial review just because a case is attended with purely legal issues. Jurisdiction ought to be distinguished from justiciability. Jurisdiction pertains to competence to hear, try, comma, and decide a case. On the other hand, determining whether the case, or any of the issues raised, is justiciable is an exercise of the power granted to a court with jurisdiction over a case that involves constitutional adjudication. Thus, even if this court has jurisdiction, the canons of constitutional adjudication in our jurisdiction allow us to disregard the questions raised at our discretion. Appraising justiciability is typified by constitutional avoidance. This remains a matter of enabling this court to act in keeping with its capabilities. Matters of policy are properly left to government organs that are better equipped at framing them. Justiciability demands that issues and judicial pronouncements be properly framed in relation to established facts, Angara v. Electoral Commission imbues these rules with its libertarian character. Principally, Angara emphasized the liberal deference to another constitutional department or organ given the majoritarian and representative character of the political deliberations in their forums. It is not merely a judicial stance dictated by courtesy but is rooted on the very nature of this court. 
unless congealed in constitutional or statutory text and imperatively called for by the actual and non-controversial facts of the case, this court does not express policy. This court should channel democratic deliberation where it should take place. Judicial restraint is also founded on a policy of conscious and deliberate caution. This court should refrain from speculating on the facts of a case and should allow parties to shape their case instead, likewise, this court should avoid projecting hypothetical situations where none of the parties can fully argue simply because they have not established the facts or are not interested in the issues raised by the hypothetical situations. In a way, courts are mandated to adopt an attitude of judicial skepticism. What we think may be happening may not at all be the case. Therefore, this court should always await the proper case to be properly pleaded and proved. Thus, concerning the extent to which transcendental importance carves exceptions to the requirements of justiciability, t he elements supported by the facts of an actual case, and the imperatives of our role as the Supreme Court within a specific cultural or historic context. Must be made clear, they should be properly pleaded by the petitioners so that whether there is any transcendental importance to a case is made an issue. That a case has transcendental importance, as applied, may have been too ambiguous and subjective that it undermines the structural relationship that this court has with the sovereign people and other departments under the Constitution. Our rules on jurisdiction and our interpretation of what is justiciable, refined with relevant cases, may be enough. Otherwise, this court would cede unfettered prerogative on parties. It would enable the parties to impose their own determination of what issues are of paramount, national significance warranting immediate attention by the highest court of the land. Point 248, emphasis supplied, citations omitted, Chamber of Real Estate and Builders Associations Incorporated. V. Energy Commission 249 lists the following considerations to determine whether an issue is of transcendental importance, 1. The character of the funds or other assets involved in the case, 2. The presence of a clear case of disregard of a constitutional or statutory prohibition by the public respondent agency or instrumentality of the government, and, three, the lack of any other party with a more direct and specific interest in the questions being raised. Point 250, citation omitted, here. All petitioners invoked the supposed transcendental importance of the constitutional issues. However, none of the exceptional conditions the exercise of this court's jurisdiction is present here. This case does not involve funds or assets. Neither was there any express disregard of a constitutional or statutory prohibition. Petitioners also failed to show that other party has a more direct, personal and material interest. Petitioners failed to invoke any source of right to bring these petitions. This court is competent to decide legal principles only in properly justiciable cases. That a party must have standing in court is not a mere technical rule that may easily be waived. Courts should be scrupulous in the principles of justiciability, or else their legitimacy may be undermined. Point 251. Transcendental Importance Of issues excusing requisite standing should not be so recklessly invoked, and is justified only in circumstances. The alleged transcendental importance of the issues raised here will be served when there are actual cases with the proper parties suffering an actual or imminent injury. No injury so great and so imminent was shown such that this court cannot instead adjudicate on the occasion of an appropriate case. 14. The writ of certiorari which may be issued under Rule 65 of the Rules Court must be distinguished from the writ of certiorari that may be issued to the expanded certiorari jurisdiction 252, under Article 8, Section 1, Paragraph 2 of the 1987 Constitution. 253 The latter is a remedy for breaches of constitutional rights by any branch or instrumentality of the government. Meanwhile, the special civil action under Rule 65 is limited to a review of judicial and quasi-judicial acts. The following summarizes the between the two avenues for certiorari.
which while, these two avenues are distinct, this court has allowed in view. Its power to relax its rules of procedure recourse to petitions for under Rule 65 to inabai reliefs that, invoke expanded certiorari jurisdiction. 254 Regardius, they, expansion of this court's judicial power is by no an abandonment of the need to satisfy the basic requisites of justiciability. 255 Ultimately the nature of judicial power means that this court is competent to decide legal principles only when there is an actual case brought by the proper parties who suffer direct, material, and substantial injury. 15. The special civil actions of petitions for certiorari and mandamus cannot afford petitioners the reliefs they seek. Rule 65 Petitions are not per se remedies to resolve constitutional issues. Instead. They are filed to address the jurisdictional excesses of officers or bodies exercising judicial or quasi-judicial functions. 256 Rule 65, Section L of the Rules of Court provides, Section 1. Petition for certiorari. When any tribunal, board, or officer exercising judicial or quasi-judicial functions has acted without or in excess, its or his jurisdiction, or with grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction, and there is no appeal, or any plain, speedy, and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law, a person aggrieved thereby may file a verified petition in the proper court. Alleging the facts with certainty and praying that judgment be rendered annulling or modifying the proceedings of such tribunal, board, or officer, and granting such incidental reliefs as law and justice may require. The petition shall be accompanied by a certified true copy of the judgment, order, or resolution subject thereof, copies of all pleadings and documents relevant and pertinent thereto, and a sworn certification of non-forum shopping as provided 1 and the third paragraph of Section 3, Rule 46. 1a. The petition shall also contain a sworn certification of non-forum shopping as provided in the third paragraph of Section 3, Rule 46, 3a. A petition for certiorari under Rule 65 will prosper only when the requisites are present, 1, the writ must be directed against a, a board or officer exercising judicial or quasi-judicial functions, 2, the tribunal board or officer must have acted without or in excess of or with grave abuse of discretion, and, 3, there is no appeal or any plain, speedy, and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. 257. Dot dash dash backslash. Not every instance of abuse of discretion should lead this court to its power of judicial review. The abuse of discretion must be grave to a lack or excess of jurisdiction. Sinan v. Civil Service Commission 258 explains, by grave abuse of discretion is meant such capricious and whimsical exercise of judgment as is equivalent to lack of jurisdiction. The abuse of discretion must be patent and gross as to amount to an evasion of positive duty or a virtual refusal to perform a duty enjoined by law, or to act at all in contemplation of law, as where the power is exercised in an arbitrary and despotic manner by reason of passion or hostility. 259, cite at 1 on omitted, a writ of certiorari is unavailing here. The Assailed Government Act is President's withdrawal from the Rome Statute. This by any stretch of imagination, may not be considered an exercise of judicial or quasi-power. A political question exists when the issue does not call on this court to determine legality and adjudicate, but to interpret the wisdom of a law or an act. 260 It has been defined as a question which, under the Constitution, is to be decided by the people in their sovereign capacity or in regard to which full discretionary authority has been delegated to the legislature or executive branch BF the government 261, in integrated bar of the Philippines v. Zamora, 262 one class of cases wherein the court hesitates to rule. On our political questions. The reason is that political questions are concerned with issues dependent upon the wisdom, not the legality, of a particular act or measure being assailed. Moreover, the political question being a function of the separation of powers, the courts will not normally interfere with the workings of another co-equal branch unless the case shows a clear need for the courts to step in to uphold the law and the constitution. In the classic formulation of Justice Brennan in Baker v. 
car. Prominent on the surface of any case held to involve a political question is found a textually demonstrable constitutional commitment of the issue to a coordinate political department, or a lack of judicially discoverable and manageable standards for resolving it, or the impossibility of deciding without an initial policy determination of a kind clearly for non-judicial discretion, or the impossibility of a court's undertaking independent resolution without expressing lack of the respect due coordinate branches of government, or an unusual need for unquestioning adherence to a political decision already made, or the potentiality of embarrassment from multifarious pronouncements by various departments oil the one question. 263, citation omitted, courts cannot resolve a political question. It is not within the purview judicial functions, and must be left to the sound discretion of the political agents the executive or the legislature. It is true that we have previously said that it is wrong to mistake a foreign relations as political questions, which are completely beyond the reach of judicial review. Nevertheless, generally, the pursuit of foreign relations is in the executive domain, and thus, pertains to the President, 264 the primary architect of foreign policy. As explained in Bayan vs Zamora 265 by constitutional fiat and by the intrinsic nature of his office, the President, as head of state, is the sole organ and authority in the external affairs of the country. In many ways, the President is the chief architect of the nation's foreign policy, his dominance in the field, of foreign relations is then conceded. Wielding dot vast powers and influence. His conduct in the external affairs of the nation, is executive altogether 266, citations omitted, between the executive and this court, it is the executive that the Philippines in the international sphere. This court interprets laws, but its determinations are effective only within the bounds of Philippine jurisdiction. Even within these bounds, this court must caution itself in interpreting the constitution and our laws, for it can undermine the discretion of the political agencies. This court's mandate is clear. It is the of grave abuse of discretion that sanctions us to act it is not merely discretion, but abuse of that discretion, and it is not only abuse of discretion, but grave abuse of discretion. The President's withdrawal from the Rome Statute, was in accordance the mechanism provided in the treaty. The Rome Statute itself contemplated and enabled a state party's withdrawal. A state party and its cannot be faulted for merely acting within what the Rome Statute expressly allows. As far as established facts go, all there is for this court to rely on are manifest actions of the executive, which have nonetheless all been consistent with the letter of the Rome Statute. Suggestions have been made about supposed political motivations, but they remain just that, suggestions suppositions. Were the situation different? Where it is shown that the presidents of discretion ran afoul of established procedure, or was done in disregard of previously declared periods for rectification, terms, guidelines, or injunctions. Belying any rhyme or reason in the course of action hastily and haphazardly taken, or was born out of vindictiveness, as merely out of personal motives, to please personal tastes or to placate personal perceived injuries whimsical and arbitrary exercise of discretion may be appreciated. Impelling this court to rule on the substance of petitions and grant the relief sought. 16. Rule 65, Section 3 of the Rules of Court provides, Section 3. Petition for Mandamus. When any tribunal, corporation, board, officer, or person unlawfully neglects the performance of an act which the law specifically enjoins as a duty resulting from an office, trust, or station, or unlawfully excludes another from the use and enjoyment of a right or office to which such other is entitled, and there is no other plain, speedy and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law, the person aggrieved thereby may file a verified petition in the proper court, alleging the facts with certainty and praying that judgment be rendered commanding the respondent, immediately or at some other time to be specified by the court, to do the act required to be done to protect the rights of the petitioner, and to pay the damages sustained by the petitioner by reason of the wrongful acts of the respondent. Treasurer of the Philippines 267 discussed the requisites the issuance of a writ of mandamus, a writ of mandamus may issue in either of two, two, situations, first, when any tribunal, 
Corporation, Board. Officer or person unlawfully neglects the performance of an act which the law specifically enjoins as a duty resulting from an office, trust, or station, second, when any tribunal, corporation, board, officer, or person unlawfully excludes another from the use and enjoyment of a right or office to which such other is entitled. The first situation demands a concurrence between a clear legal DGHT e crinning to patitibni.rnu, correlative duty incumbent upon respondents to perform an AET. This duty being imposed upon them by law. Petitioner's legal right must have already been clearly established. It cannot be a prospective entitlement that is yet to be settled. In Lim Tay v. Court of Appeals, this court emphasized that Mjandamus will not issue to establish a right, but only to enforce one that is already established. In P. Fian Co v. Moral, this court underscored that a writ of Mandamus never issues in doubtful cases. Respondents must also be shown to have actually neglected to perform the act mandated by law. Clear in the text of Rule 65. Section 3 is the requirement that respondents unlawfully neglect the performance of a duty. The mere existence of a legally mandated duty or the pendency of its performance does not suffice. The duty subject of mandamus must be ministerial rather than discretionary. A court cannot subvert legally vested authority for a body or officer to exercise discretion. In Syha v. Galang Mandamus will not issue to control the exercise of discretion of a public officer where the law imposes upon him the duty to exercise his judgment in reference to any matter in which he is required to act, because it is his judgment that is to be exercised and not that of the court. This court distinguished discretionary functions from ministerial duties, and related the exercise of discretion to judicial and quasi-judicial powers. In Sampson v. Barrios, Discretion when applied to public functionaries, means a power or right conferred upon them by law of acting officially, under certain circumstances, according to the dictates of their own judgments and consciences, uncontrolled by the judgments or C9N sciences of others. A purely ministerial act or duty, in contradistinction to a discretional act, is one which an officer or tribunal performs in a given state of facts, in a prescribed manner, in obedience to the mandate of legal authority without regard to or the exercise of his own judgment upon the propriety or impropriety of the act done. If the law imposes a duty upon a public officer, and gives him the right to decide how or when the duty shall be performed, such duty is discretionary and not ministerial. The duty is ministerial only when the discharge of the same requires neither the exercise of official discretion nor judgment. Mandamus will not lie to control the exercise of discretion of an inferior tribunal, when the act complained of is either judicial or quasi-judicial. It is the proper remedy when the case presented is outside of the exercise of judicial discretion. Mandamus, too, will not issue unless it is shown that there is no other plain, speedy and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. This is a requirement basic to all remedies under Rule 65, i.e., certiorari, Prohibition, and Mandamus.268, Emphasis Supplied, Citations Omitted, A Writ of Mandamus Lies to Compel the Performance of Duties that are Ministerial, and not those that are Discretionary. Petitioners must show that they have a clear legal right and that there was a neglected duty was incumbent upon the public officer. Here, however, there is no showing that the President has the duty imposed by law to retract his withdrawal from the Rome Statute. Certainly, there is no constitutional or statutory provision granting the right to compel the executive to withdraw from any treaty. It discretionary upon the president, as primary architect of our foreign to perform the assailed act. Moreover, issuing a writ of mandamus will not ipso facto restore the to membership in the International Criminal Court. No in the Rome Statute directs how a state party may reverse its from the treaty. It cannot be guaranteed that the note verbal's depository, the United Nations Secretary-General, will assent to this court's compulsion to reverse the country's withdrawal. This court is not an international court. It may only rule on the effect international law on the domestic sphere. What is within its purview is the effectivity of laws among states, but the effect of international law on constitution and our municipal laws. 
Not only do petitioners pray for a directed at a discretionary function, but the relief they seek through court's finite authority is ineffectual and futile. Ultimately, mandamus will not lie. 17. Pacta sunt servanda is a generally accepted principle of international that preserves the sanctity of treaties. This principle is expressed in 26 of the Vienna Convention, Article 26 Pacta sunt servanda Every treaty in force is binding upon the parties to it and must be performed by them in good faith. A supplementary provision is found in Article 46, Article 46 Provisions of Internal Law Regarding Competence to Conclude Treaties 1. A state may not invoke the fact that dot its consent to be bound by a treaty has been expressed in violation of a provision of its internal law regarding competence to conclude treaties as invalidating its consent unless that violation was manifest and concerned a rule of its internal law of fundamental importance. A violation is manifest if it would be objectively evident to any state conducting itself in the matter in accordance with normal practice and in good faith. A state party may not invoke the province one ons of its internal law to its failure to perform a treaty. Under international law, we cannot plead our own laws to excuse our non-compliance with our obligations. The March 15, 2018 note verbal submitted by the Department of Foreign Affairs, through our Ambassador to the United Nations, partly reads, The Government of the Republic of the Philippines has the honor to inform the Secretary-General. In his capacity as depositary of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, of its decision to withdraw from the Rome Statute of the International Degree Criminal Court in accordance with the relevant provisions of the statute. The Philippines assures the community of nations that the Philippine government continues to be guided by the rule of law embodied in its constitution, which also enshrines the country's long-standing tradition of upholding human rights. The government affirms its commitment to fight against impunity for atrocity crimes, notwithstanding its withdrawal from the Rome Statute, especially since the Philippines has a national legislation punishing atrocity crimes. The government remains resolute in affecting its principal responsibility to ensure the long-term safety of the nation in order to promote inclusive national development and secure a decent and dignified life for all. The decision to withdraw is the Philippines' principled stand against those who politicize and weaponize human rights, even as its independent and well-functioning organs and agencies continue to exercise jurisdiction over complaints, issues, problems and concerns arising slash ram its efforts to protect its people. Point 169, emphasis supplied, the Philippines' withdrawal was submitted in accordance with provisions of the Rome Statute. The President complied with the of the treaty from which the country withdrew. There cannot be a violation of Pacta Sunt Servanda when the Executive acted precisely in accordance with the procedure laid out by that treaty. Article 127, 1, of the Statute states, 1. A state party may, by written notification addressed to the Secretary-General of the United Nations, withdraw from this statute. The withdrawal shall take effect one year after the date of receipt of the notification, unless the notification specifies a later date. From its text, the Rome Statute provides no room to reverse the withdrawal from it. While there is a one-year period before the takes effect, it is unclear whether we can read into that proviso a permission for a state party to rethink its position, and retreat from its withdrawal. In any case, this court has no competence to interpret with finality let alone bind the International Criminal Court, the Assembly of States individual state parties, and the entire international community this provision means, and conclude that undoing a withdrawal is viable. In the face of how the Rome Statute enables withdrawal but does not contemplate the undoing of a withdrawal, this court cannot compel external of any prospective undoing which it shall order. To do so could mean courting international embarrassment. Just the same, any such potential embarrassment or other unpalatable are risks that we, as a country, are willing to take is better left those tasked with crafting foreign policy. The Rome Statute contemplates amendments, and is replete with on it, Article 121 Amendments 1. After the expiry of seven years from the entry into force of this statute, any state party may propose amendments thereto. The text of any proposed amendment shall be submitted to the Secretary-General of the United Nations, who shall promptly circulate it to all states' parties. 2. 
No sooner than three months from the date of notification, the Assembly of States Parties, at its next meeting, shall, by a majority of those present and voting, decide whether to take up the proposal. The Assembly may deal with the proposal directly or convene a review conference if the issue involved so warrants. 3. The adoption of an amendment at a meeting of the Assembly of States Parties or at a review conference on which consensus cannot be reached shall require a two-thirds majority of States Parties. 4. Except as provided in paragraph 5, an amendment shall enter into force for all States Parties one year after instruments of ratification or acceptance have been deposited with the Secretary-General of the United Nations by seven-eighths of them. 5. Any amendment to Articles 5, 6, 7, and 8 of this statute shall enter into force for those states' parties which have accepted the amendment one year after the deposit of their instruments of ratification or acceptance. In respect of a state party which has not accepted the amendment, the court shall not exercise its jurisdiction regarding a crime covered by the amendment when committed by that state party's nationals or on its territory. 6. If an amendment has been accepted by seven-eighths of states' parties in accordance with paragraph 4, any state party which has not accepted the amendment may withdraw from this statute with immediate effect, notwithstanding Article 127, paragraph 1, but subject to Article 127, paragraph 2. By giving notice no later than one year after the entry into force of such amendment. 7. The Secretary-General of the United Nations shall circulate to all states parties any amendment adopted at a meeting of the Assembly of States Parties or at a review conference. Article 122 Amendments to Provisions of an Institutional Nature 1. Amendments to provisions of this statute which are of an exclusively institutional nature, namely, Article 35, Article 36, Paragraph 8 and 9, Article 37, Article 38, Article 39, Paragraphs 1, First Two Sentences, 2 and 4, Article 42, Paragraphs 4 to 9, Article 43, Paragraphs 2 and 3, and Articles 44, 46, 47, and 49, may be proposed at any time, notwithstanding Article 121, Paragraph 1, by any State Party. The text of any proposed amendment shall be submitted to the Secretary-General of the United Nations or such other person designated by the Assembly of States Parties who shall promptly circulate it to all States Parties and to others participating in the Assembly. 2. Amendments under this article on which consensus cannot be reached shall be adopted by the Assembly of States Parties or by a review conference, by a two-thirds majority of States Parties. Such amendments shall enter into force for all states' parties six months after their adoption by the Assembly or, as the case may be, by the conference. Article 123, Review of Statute 1 Seven years after the entry into force of this statute the Secretary-General of the United Nations shall convene a review conference to consider any amendments to this statute. Such review may include, but is not limited to, the list of crimes contained in Article 5. The conference shall be open to those participating in the Assembly of States Parties and on the same conditions. 2. At any time thereafter, at the request of a State Party and for the purposes set out in paragraph 1, the Secretary-General of the United Nations shall, upon approval by a majority of States Parties, convene a review conference. 3. The provisions of Article 121, paragraphs 3 to 7, shall apply to the adoption and entry into force of any amendment to the statute considered at a review conference. Generally, Jews Coggins' rules of customary international law cannot be by treaties. As Articles 121, 122, and 123 allow the amendment of, of the Rome Statute, this indicates that the Rome Statute is not Jews Coggins. At best, its provisions are articulations of customary law, or simply, law. Article 121, 6, sanctions the immediate withdrawal of a state party if it does not agree with the amending provisions of the Rome Statute. Therefore, withdrawal from the Rome Statute is not aberrant. Precisely, the option is enabled for states' parties. 
Petitioner's contention that withdrawing from the Rome Statute effectively repeals a law is inaccurate. The Rome Statute remained in force for its state's parties, and Article 127 specifically allows state parties to withdraw. In withdrawing from the Rome Statute, the President complied with treaties' requirements. Compliance with its textual provisions cannot be susceptible of an interpretation that his act violated the treaty. Hence, withdrawal per se from the Rome Statute does not violate Pacta Sunt Servanda. 18. Petitioners in GR. No. 239,483 invoke the case of South Africa, which previously attempted to withdraw from the Rome Statute. When the was challenged by the South African Opposition Democratic the South African High Court ruled that the President's withdrawal was premature, procedurally irrational and may not be done without the approval of the Parliament. It said, the matter was argued largely on the basis that there is no provision in the Constitution or in any other legislation for withdrawal from international treaties. However, JT appears to us that there is probably a good reason why the Constitution provides for the power of the executive to negotiate and conclude international agreements but is silent on the power to terminate them. The reason is this, as the executing arm of the state, the national executive needs authority to act. That authority will flow from the Constitution or from an act of parliament. The national executive can exercise only those powers and perform those functions conferred upon it by the Constitution, or by law which is consistent with the Constitution. This is a basic requirement of the principle of legality and the rule of law. The absence of a provision in the Constitution or any other legislation of a power for the executive to terminate international agreements is therefore confirmation of the fact that such power does not exist unless and until Parliament legislates for it. It is not a lacuna or omission. 270 The ruling on South Africa's withdrawal cannot be taken as binding precedent. First, foreign judgments are not binding in our jurisdiction. At most, may hold persuasive value. 271 Francisco v. House of Representatives 272 That this court in passing upon constitutional questions, should not be beguiled by foreign jurisprudence some of which are hardly applicable because they have been dictated by different constitutional settings and 273 second. A comparison of the Philippines and South Africa's governmental structures and constitutions reveals stark differences. Our constitution states, no treaty or international agreement shall be ineffective unless concurred in by at least two-thirds of all the of the Senate. 274 On the other hand, the South African Constitution provides, Section 231. International Agreements, 1. The negotiating and signing of all international agreements is the responsibility of the national executive. 2. An international agreement binds. The Republic only after it has been approved by resolution in both the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces, unless it is an agreement referred to in subsection, 3.275, emphasis supplied, our constitution requires that when the president enters into a treaty, least two-thirds of all members of the Senate must concur for it to be valid effective. On the other hand, the South African constitution expressly that the entire parliament must approve the international agreement. Per our system of checks and balances, the Senate concurred with into the Rome Statute through Senate Resolution No. 546. In contrast, the South African Parliament had to enact a law, the of the Rome Statute of the London 1 Asiordal Criminal Court Act of 2002, 276 for the Rome Statute to be adopted in South Africa. Thus, treaty making in South Africa is vested in their Parliament, making it a concurrently legislative and not an exclusively executive act. In the treaty making is an executive act, vested in the President, the Senate's involvement is limited to mere concurrence. While there may be similarities between our constitutions, these are enough to take South Africa's case as binding precedent. We are under a presidential form of government. The way our system of checks and balances operates is different from how such a system would operate in a parliamentary government. 19. Withdrawing from the Rome Statute does not discharge a state party from the obligations it has incurred as a member. Article 127 
2, provides, a state shall not be discharged, by reason of its withdrawal, from the obligations arising from this statute while it was a party to the statute, including any financial obligations which may have accrued. Its withdrawal shall not affect any cooperation with the court in connection with criminal investigations and proceedings in relation to which the withdrawing state had a duty to cooperate and which were commenced prior to the date on which the withdrawal became effective. Nor shall it prejudice in any way the continued consideration of any matter which was already under consideration by the court prior to the date on which the withdrawal became effective. Emphasis supplied a state party withdrawing from the Rome Statute must still comply this provision. Even if it has deposited the instrument of withdrawal, it shall not be discharged from any criminal proceedings. Whatever process already initiated before the International Criminal Court obliges the state party to cooperate. Until the withdrawal took effect on March 17, 2019, the Philippines committed to meet its obligations under the Rome Statute. Any and all governmental acts up to March 17, 2019 may be taken cognizance of by the criminal court. Further, as petitioners in GR No. 239,483 underscored, you enter this reverse complementarity provision in Republic Act No. 9851, the preliminary examination opened by the International Criminal Court on the President's Drug War is not exactly harem to borrow a word used in Islam to mean any act forbidden by the Divine. Assuming such a preliminary examination proceeds. When Art 18, 3, of the Rome Statute comes into play, Republic Act No. 9851 may be invoked as basis by Philippine authorities to defer instead to the International Criminal Court in respect of any investigation on the dot same situation. 277. Consequently, liability for the alleged summary killings and other committed in the course of the war on drugs is not nullified or here. The Philippines remained covered and bound by the Rome Statute until March 17, 2019. XX Petitioners claim that the country's withdrawal from the Rome Statute their right to be provided with ample remedies for the protection of right to life and security. This fear of imagined diminution of legal remedies must be assuaged. Constitution, which embodies our fundamental rights, was in no way abrogated by the withdrawal. A litany of statutes that protect our rights in place and enforceable. As discussed, Republic Act No. 9851, or the Philippine Act on Crimes International Humanitarian Law, Genocide and Other Crimes Humanity echoes the substantive provisions of the Rome Statue. It was signed into law on December 11, 2009, two years before the Senate concurred with the Rome Statute. Republic Act No. 9851 covers rights similarly protected under the Rome Statute. Consequently, no new obligations arose from our membership in the International Criminal Court. Given the variances between the Rome Statute and Republic Act No. 9851, even be said that the Rome Statute amended Republic Act No. 9851. Republic Act No. 9851 declares the state policy of Valuing the of every human person and guaranteeing full respect for human including the rights of indigenous cultural communities and other vulnerable groups. Such as women and children. 278 It guarantees protection against the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, and their effective prosecution must be ensured taking measures at the national level, in order to, put an end to impunity for the perpetrators of these crimes. 279 It recognizes that the state must its criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes. 280 This is enforced by the Republic Act No. 9851 S Assertion of Over Crimes Committed Anywhere in the World, Section 17 Jurisdiction The state shall exercise jurisdiction over persons, whether military or civilian, suspected or accused of a crime defined and penalized in this act, regardless of where the crime is committed, provided, any one of the following conditions is met, a, 
the accused is a Filipino citizen, b, the accused, regardless of citizenship or residence, is present in the Philippines, or, c, the accused has committed the said crime against a Filipino citizen. In the interest of justice, the relevant Philippine authorities may dispense with the investigation or prosecution of a crime punishable under this act if another court or international tribunal is already conducting the investigation or undertaking the prosecution of such crime. Instead, the authorities may surrender or extradite suspected or accused persons in the Philippines to the underscore appropriate international court, if any, or to another state pursuant to the applicable extradition laws and treaties. No criminal proceedings shall be initiated against foreign nationals suspected, or accused of having committed the crimes defined and penalized in this act if they have been tried by a competent court outside the Philippines in respect of the same offense and acquitted, or having been convicted. Already served their sentence. 281 Republic Act No. 9851 expressly confers original and exclusive on regional trial courts over the offenses it punishes. It also provides that this court shall designate special courts to try these cases. 282 Unlike the Rome Statute, Republic Act No. 9851 dispenses with complementarity as a requirement for prosecution of crimes against humanity. Notably, Republic Act No. 9851 proclaims as state policy the protection of human rights of the accused, the victims, and the witnesses and provides for accessible and gender-sensitive avenues of redress, the state shall guarantee persons suspected or accused of having committed grave crimes under international law all rights necessary to ensure that their trial will he fair and prompt in strict accordance with national and international law and standards for fair trial, it shall also protect victims, witnesses, and their families, and provide appropriate redress to victims and their families. It shall ensure that the legal systems in place provide accessible and gender-sensitive avenues of redress for victims of armed conflict. 283 These state policies are operationalized in the following provisions, Section 13. Protection of Victims and Witnesses In addition to existing provisions in Philippine law for the protection of victims and witnesses, the following measures shall be undertaken, a. The Philippine court shall take appropriate measures to protect the safety, physical and physiological well-being, dignity, and privacy of victims and witnesses. In so doing, the court shall have regard of all relevant factors, including age, gender, and health, and the nature of the crime, in particular, but not limited to, where the crime involves sexual or gender violence or violence against children. The prosecutor shall take such measures particularly during the investigation and prosecution of such crimes. These measures shall not be prejudicial to or inconsistent with the rights of the accused and to a fair and impartial trial, b, as an exception to the general principle of public hearings, the court may, to protect the victims and witnesses or an accused, conduct any part of the proceedings in camera or allow the presentation of evidence by electronic or other special means. In particular, such measures shall be implemented in the case of the victim of sexual violence or a child who is a victim or is a witness, unless otherwise ordered by the court, having regard to all the circumstances, particularly the views of the victim or witness, c, where the personal interests of the victims are affected. The court shall permit their views and concerns to be presented and considered at stages of the proceeding determined to be appropriate by the court in manner which is not prejudicial to or inconsistent with the rights of the accused in a fair and impartial trial. Such views and concerns may be presented by the legal representatives of the victims where the court considers it appropriate in accordance with the established rules of procedure and evidence, and, d where the disclosure of evidence or information pursuant to this act may lead to the grave endangerment of the security of a dot witness for his slash her family, the prosecution may, for the purposes of any proceeding conducted prior to the commencement of the trial, withhold such evidence or information and instead submit a summary thereof. Such measures shall be exercised in a manner which is not prejudicial to or inconsistent with the rights of the accused and to a fair and impartial trial. Section 14 Reparations to victims dash in addition to existing provisions in Philippine law and procedural rules for reparations to victims, the following measures shall be undertaken, a, 
the court shall follow the principles relating to the reparations to or in respect of, victims, including restitution. Compensation and Rehabilitati 0 N. On this basis in its decision, the court may, whether upon request or on its own motion in exceptional circumstances, determine the score and extent of any damage, loss and injury to, or in respect of victims and state the principles on which it is acting, b, the court may make an order directly against a convicted person specifying appropriate reparations to, or in respect of, victims, including restitution, compensation and rehabilitation, and c, before making an order under this section, the court may invite and shall take account of representations from or on behalf of the convicted person, victims, or other interested persons. Nothing in this section shall be interpreted as prejudicing the rights of victims under national or international law. 284 Chapter 3 285 of Republic Act No. 9851 defines war crimes, genocide, other crimes against humanity, as similarly characterized in the Rome Statute. However, there are significant differences between the Rome Statute Act No. 9851. Republic Act No. 9851 defines torture as the intentional infliction of pain or suffering, whether physical, mental, or psychological, upon a in the custody or under the control of the accused, except that torture shall not include pain or suffering arising only from, inherent in, or incidental lawful sanctions. 286 Meanwhile, psychological means of torture are not covered by the Rome Statute. This is also a departure from Republic Act No. 9745, or the Anti-Torture Act of 2009, which limits torture to those inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a person m authority or agent of a person in authority 287 for specific purposes. Republic Act No. 9851 clustered war crimes or crimes against international degree humanitarian law into three categories, 1, an international conflict, 2, a non-international armed conflict, and, 3, other serious of laws and customs applicable in armed conflict. It then listed specific acts against protected persons or properties, or against persons no active part in hostilities. The broader definition of war crimes under Republic Act No. 9851 as compared with the Rome Statute is emphasized below, Section 4. War Crimes 4. The purpose of this Act War crimes or crimes against international humanitarian law means, a, in case of an international armed conflict, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions of August 12, 1949, namely, any of the following acts against persons or property protected under the provisions of the relevant Geneva Convention, 6. Arbitrary deportation or forcible transfer of population or unlawful confinement, 7. Taking of hostages, 8. Compelling a prisoner of war or other protected person to serve in the forces of a hostile power, and, 9. Unjustifiable delay in the repatriation of prisoners of war or other protected persons. b. In case of a non-international armed conflict, serious violations of common Article 3 to the 4, 4, Geneva Conventions of August 12, 1949, namely, any of the following acts committed against persons taking no active part in the hostilities, including members of the armed forces who have laid down their arms and those placed or to combat by sickness, wounds, detention, or any other cause, 1, violence to life and person, in particular, willful killings, mutilation, cruel treatment and torture, 3, intentionally directing attacks against buildings, material, medical units, and transport and personnel using the distinctive emblems of the Geneva Conventions or additional protocol LLL in conformity with international law, 6, launching an attack against works or installations containing dangerous forces in the knowledge that such attack will cause excessive loss of life, injury to civilians or damage to civilian objects, and causing death or serious injury to body or health, 8, killing or wounding a person in the knowledge that he slash she is or to combat, including a combatant who, having laid down his slash her arms or no longer having means of defense.
has surrendered at discretion, 9, making improper USC of a flag, of truce of the flag or the military insignia and uniform of the enemy or of the United Nations, as well as of the distinctive emblems of the Geneva Conventions or other protective signs under international humanitarian law. Resulting 3 death, serious personal injury or capture, 12, killing, wounding or capturing an adversary by resort to perfidy, 19, committing rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization or any other form of sexual violence. Also constituting a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions or a serious violation of common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions, 21 intentionally using starvation of civilians as a method of warfare by depriving them of objects indispensable to their survival. Including willfully impeding relief supplies as provided for under the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols, 24, committing any of the following acts, i, conscripting, enlisting or recruiting children under the age of 15, 15, years into the National Armed Forces, 2, conscripting, enlisting, or recruiting children under the age of 18, 8, years into an armed force or group other than the National Arm. Ed Forces, and, 3, using children under the age of 18, 18, years to participate actively in hostilities, and any person found guilty of committing any of the acts specified herein shall suffer the penalty provided under Section 7 of this Act. 288, emphasis supplied. Acts of Willful Killing as opposed to murder under the Rome deportation or forcible transfer of populations, torture, and the sexual offences under the third category of war crimes, are also listed as crimes against humanity under Republic Act No. 9851. Unlike the Rome Statute, Republic Act No. 9851 also adds or among other crimes against humanity persecution against any group or collectivity based on their sexual orientation. Enforced or involuntary disappearance of persons is also a punishable crime against humanity. 289, Republic Act No. 9851 holds superiors liable as principals for crimes by subordinates under their effective command and control. 290 provides for command responsibility as a form of criminal complicity jurisprudence has recognized, 291 in other words. Command responsibility may be loosely applied in Amparo cases in order to identify those accountable individuals that have the power to effectively implement whatever processes an Amparo court would issue. In such application, the Amparo court does not impute criminal responsibility but merely pinpoint the superiors it considers to be in the best position to protect the rights of the aggrieved party. Such identification of the responsible and accountable superiors may well be a preliminary determination of criminal liability which, of course, is still subject to further investigation by the appropriate government agency. Relatedly, the legislature came up with Republic Act No. 9851 to include command responsibility as a form of criminal complicity in crimes against international humanitarian law, genocide and other crimes. RA 9851 is thus the substantive law that definitively imputes criminal liability to those superiors who, despite their position, still fail to take all necessary and reasonable measures within their power to prevent or repress the commission of illegal acts or to submit these matters to the competent authorities for investigation and prosecution. 292, emphasis supplied. Citations omitted, all told the more restrictive Rome Statute may have even weakened. Substantive protections already previously afforded by Republic Act No. 9851. In such a case, it may well be beneficial to remove the confusion brought about by maintaining a treaty whose contents are inconsistent with antecedent statutory provisions. XXI. It has been opined that the principles, of law in the Rome Statute are accepted principles of international law. Assuming that this is true and considering the incorporation clause, the Philippines' withdrawal from Rome Statute would be a superfluity thus, ultimately ineffectual. The Philippines would remain bound by obligations expressed in the Rome Statute, generally accepted principles of international law form part of Philippine laws even if they do not derive from treaty obligations of the Philippines.
some customary international laws have been affirmed and embodied in treaties and conventions. A treaty constitutes evidence of customary law if it is declaratory of customary law, or if it is intended to codify customary law. In such a case, even a state not party to the treaty would be bound thereby. A treaty which is merely a formal expression of customary international law is enforceable on all states because of their membership in the family of nations. For instance, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations is binding even on non-party states because the provisions of the convention are mostly codified rules of customary international law binding on all states even before their codification into the Vienna Convention. Another example is the Law of the Sea which consists mostly of codified rules of customary international law, which have been w one iversally observed even before the law of the sea was ratified by participating states. Corollarily, treaties may become the basis of customary international law. While states which are not parties to treaties or international agreements are not bound, thereby, such agreements, if widely dot accepted for years by many states, may transform into customary international laws, in which case, they bind even non-signatory states. In Republic v. Sandaganbayan, this court held that even in the absence of the Constitution, generally accepted principles of international law remain part of the laws of the Philippines. During the interregnum, or the, period after the actual takeover of power by the revolutionary government in the Philippines, following the cessation of resistance by loyalist forces up to March 24, 1986, immediately before the adoption of the Provisional Constitution. The 1973 Philippine Constitution was abrogated and there was no municipal law higher than the directives and orders of the revolutionary government. Nevertheless, this court ruled that even during this period, the provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to which the Philippines is a signatory, remained in effect in the country. The Covenant and Declaration are based on generally accepted principles of international law which are applicable in the Philippines even in the absence of a constitution, as during the interregnum. Consequently, applying the provisions of the Covenant and the Declaration, the Filipino people continued to enjoy almost the same rights found in the Bill of Right, despite the abrogation of the 1973 Constitution. The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted by 120 members of the United Nations UN, on July 17.1998. It entered into force on July 1, 2002, after 60 states became party to the statute through ratification or accession. The adoption of the Rome Statute fulfilled the international community's long-time dream of creating a permanent international tribunal to try serious international crimes. The Rome Statute, which established an international criminal court and formally declared genocide, war crimes and other crimes against humanity as serious international crimes, codified generally accepted principles of international law, including customary international laws. The principles of law embodied in the Rome Statute were already generally accepted principles of international law even prior to the adoption of the statute. Subsequently, the Rome Statute itself has been widely accepted and, as of November 2010, it has been ratified by 114 states, 113 of which are members of the UN. There are at present 192 members of the Union. Since 113 member states have already ratified the Rome Statute, more than a majority of all the UN members have now adopted the Rome Statute as part of their municipal laws. Thus, the Rome Statute itself is generally accepted by the community of nations as constituting a body of generally accepted principles of one international law. The principles of law found in the R01NE statute constitute generally accepted principles of international law enforceable in the Philippines under the Philippine Constitution. The principles of law embodied in the Rome statute are binding on the Philippines even if the statute has yet to be ratified by the Philippine Senate. In short, the principles of law enunciated in the Rome statute are now part of Philippine domestic law pursuant to Section 2. Article 2 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution.293, Emphasis in the Original, Citations Omitted, Chapter 7, Section 15 of Republic Act No. 
9851 enumerates the sources of international law that guide its interpretation and Section 15 Applicability of International Law In the application and interpretation of this Act, Philippine courts shall be guided by the following sources, a. the 1948 Genocide Convention, b. the 1949 Geneva Conventions i4. Their 1977 additional protocols I and point two and their 2005 additional protocol L, C, the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed, Conflict. Its first protocol and its 1999 second protocol, D. The 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child and its 2000 I optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict, E. The Rules and Principles of Customary International Law, F. The Judicial Decisions of International Courts and Tribunals, G. Relevant and Applicable Underscore, International Human Rights Instruments, H. Other Relevant International Treaties and Conventions Ratified or Acceded to by the Republic of the Philippines, and, I. Teachings BF the most highly qualified publicists and authoritative commentaries on the foregoing sources as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of international law. As listed by the Office of the Solicitor Genera, the Philippines also as state party to these international conventions and human rights instruments, III, A, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, B, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, C, the Convention Against Torture, I, D, the Convention on the Discrimination Against Women, and Elimination of Discrimination, and I, E, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. 294. Thus, petitioners concern that the country's withdrawal from the statute abjectly and reversibly subverts our basic human rights appears to be baseless and purely speculative. All told, the consolidated petitions are dismissed for failing to justiciability. While we commend the zealousness of petitioners seeking to ensure that the President acts within the bounds of the Constitution, they had no standing to file their suits, we cannot grant that they seek. The unfolding of events, including the International Court's acknowledgement of withdrawal even before the lapse of one year from initial notice rendered the petitions moot, removing any potential relief from this Court's sphere. Mechanisms that safeguard human rights and protect against the grave offences sought to be addressed by the Rome Statute remain formally in in this jurisdiction. Further, the International Criminal Court retains jurisdiction over any and all acts committed by government actors until March 17, 2019. Hence, withdrawal from the Rome Statute does not affect the liabilities of individuals charged before the International Criminal Court for acts committed up to this date. As guide for future cases, th.is court recognizes that as primary I architect QF foreign policy, the president enjoys a degree of leeway to withdrawn from treaties which are bona fide, deemed contrary to the constitution or our laws, and to withdraw in keeping with the national policy adopted pursuant to the constitution and our laws. However, the President's discretion to withdraw is qualified by the of legislative involvement on the manner by which a treaty was into or came into effect, the President cannot unilaterally withdraw from treaties that were entered into pursuant to the legislative intent in prior laws, or subsequently affirmed by succeeding laws. Where Senate concurrence for accession is expressly premised on same concurrence for withdrawal, likewise cannot be the subject of unilateral withdrawal. The imposition of Senate concurrence as a condition be made piecemeal, through individual Senate resolutions pertaining to specific treaties, or through encompassing legislative action, such as a law, a resolution by Congress, or a comprehensive Senate resolution. Ultimately, the exercise of discretion to withdraw from treaties and international agreements is susceptible to judicial review in cases attended by grave abuse of discretion as when there is no clear, definite, or reliable showing of repugnance to the Constitution or RST underscore atuts. Or in cases of inordinate unilateral withdrawal violating requisite legislative involvement. Any attempt to invoke the, power of judicial review must conform to the basic requisites of justiciability. Such attempt can only proceed when attended by incidents demonstrating a properly justiciable controversy. Wherefore, 
the Consolidated Petitions, NG.R, NOS. 238,875, Arid 240,954 are dismissed for being moot. So ordered.